zetetic cosmic or conclusive evidence that the world is not a rotating revolving globe, but a stationary plane circle by rectangle. Preface to second edition. The first edition of this work, an unpretentious pamphlet of 48 pages, was published. So much interest in the subject has been manifested that a second edition is without doubt called for. In fact, long after the first edition was exhausted, letters from various parts of the world were received, asking for copies which, to our regret, could not be supplied. In that pamphlet, very much of the evidence we had accumulated from various sources had to be omitted, so as to reduce what otherwise would have been a bulky volume to a short treatise, retaining sufficient evidence to convince the minds of those who would take cognizance of and duly estimate proved facts of nature. Labors have not been in vain. Many have been enabled to see through the delusions of modern astronomy. Letters from various parts testify that, in some cases, men and women have begun to make use of their brain power, which had been stunted and dwarfed by acceptation, without the slightest proof of the unscientific, unreasonable, unnatural, and infidel teachings of men foisted upon a credulous public in the name of science. Others, again, tell that the writers have thrown to the moles and to the bats the worldwide and almost universally believed hoax that we are living on a whirling sea earth globe revolving faster than a cannonball travels, rushing through space at a rate beyond human power to conceive. And flying with the whole of the so-called solar system, in another direction 20 times the speed of its rotation. To the editors of newspapers who, whether favorably or unfavorably, reviewed the pamphlet, our thanks are due and now respectfully tendered. This edition is sent forth with the assurance of the divine blessing and the firm conviction that truth is strong and must prevail. T.W. Castle Buildings, Durban, Natal, South Africa, November 1899. Introduction. It will be noticed that the style of this volume differs considerably from the first edition. In that edition, we divided the book into four parts. These scientific assertions, Bible statements, natural proofs, and applications and conclusions. The first of these was covered by extracts from well-known astronomical works. The second was filled with Bible quotations, the direct opposite of the astronomical speculations. The third division contains many proofs of the impossibility of the truth of the globe theory, the last division being made up of the logical arguments founded on the first three. Modern astronomical teaching affirms that we live on a globe, which rotates, revolves, and spins away in space at brain-reeling rates of speed that the sun is a million and a half times the size of the earth globe and nearly a hundred million miles distant from it. that the moon is about a quarter the size of the earth, 
that it receives all its light from the sun, and is thus only a reflector, and not a giver of light, that it attracts the body of the earth, and thus causes the tides, that the stars are worlds and suns, some of them equal in importance to our own, sun himself, and others vastly superior, that these worlds, inhabited by sentient beings, are without numbers and occupy space, boundless in extent, and illimitable in duration, the whole of these interlaced bodies being subject to, and supported by, universal gravitation, the foundation and the father of the whole fabric. minds and theoretical speculators, the so-called science of modern astronomy furnishes a field, unsurpassed in any science for the unrestrained license of the imagination, and the building up of a complicated conjuration of absurdities, such as to overawe the simpleton and make him gape with wonder, to deceive even those who truly believe their assumptions to be facts, and to make men doubt divine revelation, with as little discrimination as they were formerly called upon to believe. If the reader will carefully follow and weigh the evidence of the following chapters, he cannot fail to be delivered from the thraldom of popular credulity and led to seek the truth for himself. Current science declares that the earth was once shot off from the sun, a piece of molten rock which, by universal attraction, became larger, by indrafts from without, as the late R. A. Proctor assures us. This molten mass took 350 million years to cool down, for protoplasm to get a footing which took millions of years by evolution and selection to produce a Darwinian ape. Evolution and selection allied to and combined with the survival of the fittest, again took many millions of years to evolve primeval man, many ages again elapsing before historical man was produced. There are four bodies, according to the late R. A. Proctor, which represent four stages of what we may term astronomical progression, as follow. The moon was once inhabited, but is now a chaotic mass. 2. The Earth is inhabited. It was once like the planet Jupiter. Earlier still it was like the Sun, and will become like the Moon now is. Jupiter was once like the Sun. It is being prepared for inhabitants. When inhabited, it will be like the Earth. When its race as an inhabited world has been run, it will become like the Moon. The sun will become like Jupiter, and another sun will have taken its place. Later it will become like the earth, and will then be inhabited. Later still it will become chaotic like the moon, and so on for countless ages, in fact forever. What a grand conception, yea, rather, what a grand perversion of the reasoning powers, and what stultification of common sense. What an abuse of precious gifts in order to satisfy a fertile imagination and supply idle curiosity with something new in the domain of science. No one who reads the Bible but can see how these unfounded speculations are diametrically opposed to its plain teaching. The science of the 19th century and the science of the Bible are totally at variance. If the one be true, the other is necessarily false. Which is it? Let the evidence here placed before the reader answer the question. Let honest-minded men and women who read these pages learn the truth for themselves by practical investigation into the facts herein set forth, which we challenge the whole scientific world to successfully dispute. We court no favor and fear no foe, scientific or otherwise. All we ask is careful attention and practical investigation. We have no fear as to the logical conclusion which shall be arrived at. Assumptions In order to account for natural phenomena in keeping with the assertions of the learned, many hypotheses have to be laid down, and many unfounded assumptions are absolutely necessary to support the unsound fabric of astronomical imagination. In Modern Science and Modern Thought by S. Lang, the following occurs on page 51. What is the material universe composed of? Ether, matter, and energy. Ether is not actually known to us by any test of which the senses can take cognizance, but is a sort of mathematical substance, which we are compelled to assume in order to account for the phenomena of light and heat. Whatever explanation may be furnished regarding light and heat on this basis, 
must be discarded as utterly untrustworthy because the premises are assumed. Once upon a time it was stated that the stars were motionless, but as soon as Assumption was allowed to talk, the scene was changed for, as Science Siftings informs us on volume 6, page 39, as soon as it was conjectured that the stars were subject to the law of gravitation, it was inferred that they were not motionless. Professor Huxley had to resort to Assumption to account for the disappearance of ships at sea, although had he known the truth of the matter, or taken the trouble to inquire, his unwarranted assumptions would have been totally unnecessary. He says, We assume the convexity of the water because we know of no other way to explain the appearance and disappearance of ships at sea. What learning! What profound wisdom! If we know of no other way, it is better to admit the fact and wait until we have found out some other way, to explain the difficulty if there is any. Knowledge is gained by practical investigation and experience, and has no need of the assistance of assumption to provide an excuse for ignorance. If water could be proved to be convex, there would be no need to assume it to be so. We should have many proofs and abundant evidence of the fact. But the fact that water has been proved to be level hundreds of times makes it necessary for those who refuse to believe proved facts which tell against their theory to resort to assumption to maintain their unreasoning position. And yet the same professor in his book Science and Culture says, the assertion which outstrips evidence is not only a blunder but a crime. The assertion, therefore, that water is convex against proof furnished many times over that it is level is not only a blunder but a crime. The Age of the Earth this is a subject which has been speculated upon. I shall quote a few of the more prominent assumptions. Sir Robert Ball in his Story of the Heavens, pages 169 and 170, tells us that we cannot pretend to know how many thousands of millions of years ago this epoch was, but we may be sure that earlier still the earth was even hotter, until at length we seem to see the temperature increase to a red heat. From a red heat we look back to a still earlier age when the earth was white hot. Back again till we find the molten surface of our now solid globe was actually molten. But imagination goes still further than this. In Our Place Among Infinities by R.A. Proctor, pages 9 and 10, we find the following. Let it suffice that we recognize as one of the earliest stages of our Earth's history her condition as a rotating mass of glowing vapor, capturing, then as now, but far more actively then than now, masses of matter which approached near enough and growing by these continual indrafts from without. How we are to recognize that the Earth was once a rotating mass of vapor, we are not told. On what evidence the recognition rests is not stated. Perhaps it is not too much to assume that this is like most other assumptions of the astronomical schools, without the slightest vestige of possibility to say nothing of probability. Sir R. Ball tells us that we may be sure that the Earth was once actually molten, but on what provable data the surety of this actuality rests we are left to the foggy mazes of imagination to discover. But imagination, assisted by assumption, will account for anything. And so we are told that it took 350 million years for the Earth to cool down from a temperature of 2000 centigrade to 200. Proctor says that Bischoff has shown this, and so we ought to be sure enough. Were similar ridiculous statements made in relation to any other science than astronomy or geology, I believe the general reader or the general public would dismiss them at sight. But because they are made in a domain of science, where the general reader in most cases cannot follow, they are allowed to pass as the genuine product of learning and investigation, whereas they are at best but wild and utterly impossible theories. In Modern Science and Modern Thought, page 44, we are informed that it is right, however, to state that all mathematical calculations of time based on the assumed rate at which cosmic matter cools into suns and planets and these into solid and habitable globes 
are in the highest degree uncertain. Thus, after all the labor to establish a theory, allied with much skill in setting it forth, in its best dress, we are calmly assured that all these tall figures and imaginations are based on premises which are in the highest degree uncertain. If evidence for rejecting these fanciful hypotheses summarily and in toto were wanting, surely it is now furnished to satisfaction. Not only are these mathematical calculations of assumed premises in the highest degree uncertain, but they are to be classed with the tomfooleries of the age and reckoned among the many and impossible absurdities of the present day. One of the chief of recent speculations regarding the Earth is that it is a body like the planets because it has been shown that the sun and the stars are of the same constituent parts as the earth. Iron, salt, etc. are said to be elements of the sun's composition. And as the earth contains these and other minerals, it is a globe or planet like the other heavenly bodies which contain the same metals. What is known as spectrum analysis is relied upon as proving this. A prism is placed in position so as to intercept the sun's rays, and the colors seen through this instrument, red, orange, yellow, blue, are said to be the result of the various metals contained in the sun, in a state of fusion, emitting their several colors in the combined sunlight, which total light is decomposed into its component colors by the prism, with the object of testing the conclusions arrived at by the learned relative to spectrum analysis, several experiments were made by the writer. The light of the sun on a clear day, about noon, seen through the prism disclosed the various colors that can be seen through this instrument. On a hazy day before sunset, the colors seen were the same, but very faint. Light from a lighthouse and a star, seen through the prism, showed the colors to be the same. The color from the light of the star being much less brilliant than that from the lighthouse. The light from a paraffin street lamp gave the same result as light from the star or the sun, only much fainter. And then the electric light was tried. A large street lamp of great power and several others of less power gave the same result as the sun, star, lighthouse, and street lamp, but in various degrees of brilliancy, according to the power of the light. Even a candle gave a very faint yellow-blue tinge, so slight that it had to be looked at for some time before anything but blue was apparent. If, therefore, it be argued that spectrum analysis proves that the sun is made of the same materials as we find in the earth and that therefore the earth is a product of evolution, then it is equally clear that the electric light and the gas shade of the lamp which encases it are really composed of iron and various other metals in a state of fusion, constituting indeed a globe of glowing vapor and not glass, carbon, etc. at all. It is also as reasonable to conclude that the paraffin lamp and the candle are composed of metals in a state of fusion and that there is in reality no paraffin, no glass, no tallow, and no wick. That is to say, known facts must be thrown aside, common sense stultified, and reason dethroned in order to bolster up the unprovable assumptions of modern science relative to the doctrine of evolution as applies to the earth and the heavenly bodies. Aeronautics if the world be a ball, as Sir R. Ball gravely informs us, the aeronaut should be one of his most ardent supporters, as the highest part of the surface of the globe would be directly under the car of a balloon, and the sides would fall away or dip down in every direction. The universal testimony of aeronauts, however, is entirely against the globular assumption, as the following quotations show. The London Journal of 18th July, 1857 says, the chief peculiarity of the view from a balloon at a considerable elevation was the altitude of the horizon, which remained practically on a level with the eye, at an elevation of two miles, causing the surface of the earth to appear concave instead of convex, and to recede during the rapid ascent, whilst the horizon and the balloon seemed to be stationary. J. Glacier, FRS, in his work Travels in the Air, states, on looking over the top of the car, the horizon appeared to be on a level with the eye, and taking a grand view of the whole visible area beneath, I was struck with its great regularity. All was dwarfed to one plane. It seemed too flat, too even, apparently artificial. In his accounts of his ascents in the air, 
M. Camilla Flammarion states, the earth appeared as one immense plain richly decorated with ever varied colors. Hills and valleys are all passed over without being able to distinguish any undulation in the immense plain. Mr. Elliot, an American aeronaut, says, I don't know that I ever hinted heretofore that the aeronaut may well be the most skeptical man about the rotundity of the earth. Philosophy forces this truth upon us, but the view of the earth from the elevation of a balloon is that of an immense terrestrial basin, the deeper part of which is directly under one's feet. Zetetic Astronomy, page 37. In March 1897, I met M. Victor Emmanuel and asked him to give me an idea of the shape of the earth as seen from a balloon. He informed me that, instead of the earth declining from the view on either side, and the higher part being under the car as is popularly supposed, it was the exact opposite. The lowest part, like a huge basin, being immediately under the car, and the horizon on all sides rising to the level of the eye. This, he admitted, was exactly what should be the appearance of a plane viewed from a balloon. It is almost needless to say that a globe would present a totally different appearance, the highest part being directly under the car. Contrasts If the earth be the globe of popular belief, the same amount of heat and cold, summer and winter, should be experienced at the same latitudes north and south of the equator. The same number of plants and animals would be found, and the same general conditions exist. That the very opposite is the case disproves the globular assumption. The great contrast between places at the same latitudes north and south of the equator is a strong argument against the received doctrine of the rotundity of the Earth. From the Geological Journal for November 1893, I extract the following. A Voyage Towards the Antarctic Sea, report by William S. Bruce. On January 12, 1893, we saw what appeared to be high mountainous land and glaciers stretching from about 64 degrees 10 minutes west to about 65 degrees 30 minutes south. This, I believe, may have been the eastern coast of Graham's Land, which has never before been seen, but it would be unwise to me to be too certain, for it must have been 60 miles distant. Meteorology Periods of fine calm weather alternate with very severe gales, usually accompanied by fog and snow. The barometer never attained 30 inches. The records of air temperature are very remarkable. Our lowest temperature was 20.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Our highest, 37.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Only a difference of 16.8 degrees Fahrenheit in the total range for a period extending slightly over two months. Compare this with our climate, where in a single day and night, you may get a variation of more than twice that amount. The average temperatures show a still more remarkable uniformity. December averaged 31.14 degrees Fahrenheit for 115 readings. January 31.10 degrees Fahrenheit for 198 readings, a range of less than 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. This I consider to be very significant and worthy of special attention by future Antarctic explorers. For may it not indicate a similar uniformity of temperature, throughout the year. Antarctic cold has been much dreaded by some. The 429 readings I took during December, January, and February show an average temperature of only 30.76 degrees Fahrenheit, this being in the very height of summer in latitudes corresponding to the Faroe Islands in the north. But I believe the temperature of winter will not vary very much from that of summer. This uniformity of temperature partly accounts for the great accumulation of ice which is formed not on account of the great severity of the winter, but because there is practically no summer to melt it. Mr. Seabolm has vividly pictured the onrush of summer in the Arctic, but how different it is in the Antarctic. There, there is eternal winter, and snow never melts. As far north as a man has traveled he has found reindeer and hare basking in the sun, and country brilliant with rich flora. Within the Antarctic Circle, no plant is to be found. Report by C. W. Donald, M.B. C.M. On the passage out, we, on board the Active, touched at the beautiful island of Madeira in October, and two more months landed us in the barren Falkland Islands. 
Sailing thence on December 11th, we crossed the stormy waters to the east of Cape Horn and saw our first iceberg on December 18th. On the same day, we sighted Clarence Island, one of the South Shetlands. These are called after our own northern Shetlands, and the part sided by us lies only some 60 miles nearer the pole. But what a difference between the two places. Our own Shetlands bright with ladies' dresses and light summer garments, and carrying tennis rackets and parasols. The South Shetlands, even in the height of summer, clad in an almost complete covering of snow, only a steep cliff or a bold rock standing out in deep contrast here and there, the only inhabitants being birds or seals, and even the bird life, with the exception of the penguins, is scanty. Sir James Ross, on his third voyage, entered the ice at nearly the same spot and, fifty years before, all but a week, had sheltered from a westerly gale under the inhospitable shores of Clarence Island. Its highest point stands 4,557 feet above sea level. The following from Polar Explorations, read before the Royal Dublin Society, is taken from Zetetic Astronomy by Parallax. On the South Georges, in the same latitude as Yorkshire in the north, Cook did not find a shrub big enough to make a toothpick. Captain Cook describes it as savage and horrible. The wild rocks raised their lofty summits till they were lost in the clouds, and the valleys laid covered with everlasting snow. Not a tree was to be seen. Not a shrub even big enough to make a toothpick. Who could have thought that an island of no greater extent than this, the Isle of Georgia, situated between the latitude of 54 and 55 degrees, should in the very height of summer be in a manner wholly covered many fathoms deep with frozen snow? The lands which lie to the south are doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness, never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. The South Shetlands, occupying a corresponding latitude to their namesake in the north, present scarcely a vestige of vegetation. Kerguelen, as low as latitude 50 degrees south boasts 13 species of plants, of which only one, a peculiar kind of cabbage, has been found useful in cases of scurvy, while Iceland, 15 degrees nearer to the pole in the north, boasts 870 species. Even marine life is sparse in certain tracts of vast extent, and the seabird is seldom observed flying over such wastes. The contrast between the limits of organic life in Arctic and Antarctic zones is very remarkable and significant. Vegetables and land animals are found at nearly 80 degrees in the north, while from the parallel of 58 degrees in the south, the lichen and such like plants only clothe the rocks, and seabirds and the cetaceous tribes alone are seen upon the desolate beaches. McClintock describes herds of reindeer, a perfect forest of antlers moving north in the summer the eider duck and the brent goose through the air, the unwieldy family of the cetacea through the waters, the arctic bear upon the ice, the musk ox and reindeer along the land, all wend their way northward at certain seasons. Now these indications are absent from the southern zone, as is also the inhabitation of man. The bones of musk oxen killed by the Esquimo were found north of the 79th parallel, while in the south man is not found above the 56th parallel of latitude. This is supported by the following from the Western Christian Advocate of 10th February, 1897, copied from Appleton Science Monthly. The distinctiveness of the Antarctic climate, as compared with the Arctic, is found in the relations of both the summer and the winter temperatures. The high summer heat of in the few months of its existence has the energy to develop that lovely carpeting of grass and flowers, which gives to the low-lying lands even to the 82nd parallel of latitude, a charm equal to that of the upland meadows of Switzerland is, in a measure, wanting in the south. In its place, frequent cold and dreary fogs navigate the atmosphere, and render dreary and desolate a region that extends far into what may be properly designated the habitual zone. The fields of anemones, poppies, saxifrages, and mountain pinks of dwarf birches and willows are replaced by interminable snow and ice, with only here and there bare patches of rock, to give assurance that something underlies the snow covering. Man's habitations in the northern hemisphere extend to the 78th parallel of latitude, and formerly extended to the 82nd. In the southern hemisphere, they find their limit in Fuegia in the 55th parallel, 
fully 350 miles nearer the equator than where, as in the Shetland Islands, ladies in lawn dresses disport in the game of tennis. And still 700 miles further from the equator in Siberia, Nordenskjold found forests of pine rising with trunks 70 to 100 feet in height. Further to this, we note that seasons on the heliocentric model would work by the variation of the tilt of the Earth in its yearly cycle as it moves around the Sun. However, we would see that this 0.002% difference in the distance caused by the tilt is what they attribute this incredible change of temperature note that if the earth were spinning at 1150 miles per hour at the equator and we're spinning around the sun and we're always at an even pace that seasons should always be exactly identical with the same temperatures and the same effects at the same time of the year every year year after year in perpetuity however we see that seasons and weather changes every day and does so in a completely random or seemingly random manner having nothing to do with warmth moving from southern equatorial regions into the north, or vice versa, from northern cold moving into the southern area. Instead, what we see is vast, drastic changes in the temperatures on Earth, that the temperatures of the poles are accounted for by the sun's position over the flat Earth, but are completely not accounted for in the heliocentric model which would have the Earth having to wobble or actually change its tilt many times a year in order to account for this change in seasons. In the voyage of a naturalist by C. Darwin, pages 210 and 212, we are informed that one side of the harbor is formed by a hill about 1,500 feet high, which Captain Fitzroy has called after Sir J. Banks in commemoration of his disastrous excursion which proved fatal to two men of his party, and nearly so to Dr. Solander. The snowstorm which was the cause of this misfortune happened in the middle of January, corresponding to our July in the latitude of Durham. We were detained here several days by bad weather. The climate is certainly wretched. The summer solstice is now 25th December past. Yet every day snow fell on the hills, and in the valleys there was rain accompanied by sleet. It is utterly impossible to shut one's eyes to the fact that these evidences furnish indisputable proof that the figure of the earth cannot be globular. If it were of that shape, the same conditions would be found at equal latitudes north and south, which we have seen is not the case. Contradictions the grave contradictions that exist among the recognized teachers of astronomical science ought to cause the thinking man to pause before accepting a theory about which no two of its exponents may be found to agree. Sir Isaac Newton, in his Principia, resuscitated the fundamental proposition of Pythagoras thus, the sun is the center of the solar system and immovable. Since then, Professor Urschel discovered that the sun was not immovable. In regard to the atmosphere of the planet Mars, the same contradiction is manifest. In the Christian Million, San Jose of 9th August, 1894, we find that Mr. Norman Lockyer has been telling an interviewer that Mars is like us in many respects. It has an atmosphere like ours, he says. The Standard of 18th August, 1894, says, Professor Campbell of the Lick Observatory, announces that he has demonstrated that Mars presents no evidence of having an atmosphere. Then Mr. J. Gillespie, in his Triumph of Philosophy, page 89, comes to the rescue and says, As to the planets being inhabited, if we take refraction into account, we shall find that there is not such a thing as atmosphere near them. For instance, in an eclipse of the moon, especially at her apogee, the Earth is brought to a mere point by refraction, caused by the air of the earth, and were the moon a little further away from this point, would be brought to nothingness. That is, although the earth were exactly in a straight line between the sun and the moon, the earth would not even show a spot on the moon's disk. Now by this same rule, if either Mercury or Venus had any atmosphere, they could never be seen crossing the sun's disk. I think this is satisfactory proof that they have no atmosphere and cannot therefore be inhabited. After all this delightful uncertainty, a writer in Knowledge of February 1895 says, The interesting chapter on solar theories is well fitted to serve as a lesson in modesty. So diverse and conflicting are the various hypotheses, so difficult to harmonize are the observed facts. 
When we come to consider the atmosphere that concerns us most, the same contradictions are evident. Sir David Brewster, in his More Worlds Than One, tells us that the atmosphere of the Earth extends for about 45 miles. In Science Siftings of 18 March 1893, the following occurs. We may infer that a few hundred miles embrace all the gaseous envelope of the globe. And in Elementary Physiography, page 293, we are told that the height of the atmosphere is not known with any certainty. There is probably no fixed limit to the atmosphere. It is a fair inference from these contradictory statements that present-day scientists, so-called, do not know anything about the height of the Earth's atmosphere. Many men of thought and learning have scouted the ideas imposed upon us by Sir Isaac Newton, of which the following is a sample. The repetition of a blunder is impertinent and ridiculous. To liberate oneself from an error is difficult, sometimes indeed impossible, for even the strongest and most gifted minds. But to take up the error of another, and persist in it with stiff-necked obstinacy, is a proof of poor qualities. The obstinacy of a man of originality when he errs may make us angry, but the stupidity of the copyist irritates and renders us miserable. And if, in our strife with Sir Isaac Newton, we have sometimes passed the bounds of moderation, the whole blame is to be laid upon the school of which Newton was the head, whose incompetence is proportional to its arrogance whose laziness is proportional to its self-sufficiency, and whose virulence and love of persecution hold each other in perfect equilibrium. Through the whole of Newton's experiments there runs a display of pedantic accuracy, but how the matter really stands with Newton's gift of observation, and with his experimental aptitudes, every man possessing eyes and senses may make himself aware. It may be boldly asked, where can the man be found possessing the extraordinary gifts of Newton, who would suffer himself to be deluded by such a hocus-pocus if he had not in the first instance willfully deceived himself. Only those who know the strength of self-deception, and the extent to which it sometimes trenches on dishonesty, are in a condition to explain the conduct of Newton and of Newton's school. To support his unnatural theory, Newton heaps fiction upon fiction, seeking to dazzle when he could not convince. Goethe, Proceedings of the Royal Institution of Great Britain Volume 9, Part 3, page 353 through 355. Dr. W. Friend says, It has, over and over again, been the hope and expectation of intelligent and unprejudiced men that some less extravagant and more intelligible system would, sooner or later, be found as a substitute for the mathematical romance with which Newton has favored the world. This name has been the sanction for a device which, the more it is examined, excites the more astonishment at its adoption by men of research and observation. Then again, Kepler's law is said to be so well established and so absolutely necessary to the truth of the Newtonian hypothesis, when weighed in the balance by competent judges, are contradicted and set aside by a stroke of the pen. Professor W. B. Carpenter, in the Modern Review for October 1880, says, It was not until twelve years after the publication of his first two laws that Kepler was able to announce the discovery of the third. This, again, was the outcome of a long series of guesses, and what was remarkable as to the error of the idea which suggested the second law to his mind was still more remarkable as to the third, for not only in his search for the harmony of which he felt assured, did he proceed on the erroneous notion of a whirling force emanating from the sun, which decreases with increase of distance, but he took as his guide another assumption, no less erroneous, viz. that the masses of the planets increase with their distances from the sun. In order to make this last fit with the facts, he was driven to assume a relation of their respective densities, which we now know to be utterly untrue, for, as he himself says, Unless we assume this proportion of the densities, the law of the periodic times will not answer. Thus says his biographer, three out of the four suppositions made by Kepler to explain the beautiful law he had detected are now indisputably known to be false. What he considered to be the proof of it being only a mode of false reasoning, by which any required result might be deduced from any given principles. Newton's theory and Kepler's laws are the chief foundation of stones of modern astronomy, and when these are shaken the whole fabric reels and staggers like a drunken man. 
until sooner or later it will find a grave in the oblivion that it so well merits. The Daily Chronicle of 8th April, 1891, says, It may be a surprise to find that we are still imperfectly acquainted with the figure of the earth. The Ceylon Independent of 23rd December, 1893, has the following. This question seems to be still agitating the Austrian government, and more than one Austrian man-of-war that has called here lately has had an officer on board whose special commission was to make observations for the purpose of ascertaining the attraction of the earth in order thereby to arrive at the exact shape of the globe. An officer thus employed is on the Austrian steamer Fasana, who, since the vessel's arrival, has spent a good deal of time at the National Bank, where a room was allotted him for the purpose of adjusting his instruments. An officer engaged on similar duty was on the Kaiserin Elizabeth the other day. Von Gumpach, in his work Figure of the Earth, tells us how the men of science made the world a globe. The earth of the Newtonian theory is the mere creation of the fancy. Its shape has been determined, partly of imaginary and partly of positively erroneous elements, and results of subsequent experiments and measurements have, by means of purely mathematical factors and tentative formulas, been adapted to its presupposed figure. Mr. J. Gillespie, who believes that the earth is a globe suspended in space, with no revolution round the sun, says in his Triumph of Philosophy, page 6, I can challenge any astronomer in Great Britain on any point in theoretical astronomy and prove that the present theory is a regular burlesque, a hoax, and a swindle. If it is a sin to tell a lie, what must be the doom of men who teach generation after generation one of the most glaring and degraded falsehoods ever laid before mankind? Dr. Lardner, in his Museum of Science, says, All the diurnal changes of appearances presented by the firmament, the risings and settings of the sun, moon and stars, and their varying appearances in different latitudes, admit of being explained with equal precision and completeness, either by supposing the universe to revolve daily round the earth, or the earth to revolve daily on its axis. Then, as to the velocity of light, if light travels at all, the same glorious mixture and uncertainty again presents themselves. Guillemin, the heavens, conjectures that light travels at the rate of 192,000 miles a second. M. Leon Foucault guesses at 184,000 miles per second. Sir R. Ball at 180,000 miles. The editor of Science Siftings assumes, the first time, 186,000 miles, the second time 196,000 miles. This is all contradicted by a writer in the English Mechanic of 27th July, 1894, who says... I believe no one now holds the view that light actually moves. Most people think that there is only one school of astronomy in vogue, whereas there are at least four, all at loggerheads with each other. The Ptolemaeus, represented by J. Gillespie of Dumfries, who supposed the Earth, globe, a center for the revolution of the sun, moon, and stars. The Coreshans of America, who supposed the Earth a hollow globe for us to live inside the Newtonian Copernicans who suppose the sun a center, keeping the planets whirling in orbits by gravity, and four, the Cartesian Copernicans, who suppose the planets to whirl round the sun without the necessity of gravity. Sir R. Phillips heading up this school. Astronomy will sometimes summon geology to its aid, when difficult problems are awaiting solution, but astronomers generally claim that when the two sciences disagree, astronomy is the safest assumption. S. Lang, however, in his Modern Science and Modern Thought, claims superiority for geology. On pages 48 and 49, he says, The conclusions of geology at any rate up to the Silurian period are approximate facts and not theories, while the astronomical conclusions are theories based on data so uncertain that while in some cases they give results incredibly short, like that of 15 million years for the whole past process of the formation of the solar system, in others, they give results almost incredibly long, as in that which supposes the moon to have been thrown off when the earth was rotating in three hours. The safest course in the present state of our knowledge seems to be to assume that geology really proves the duration of the present order of things to have been somewhere over 100 million years. Thus, one fable, falsely called science, exposes another fable of about the same value. 
the safest course in the present state of the utter ignorance of science as to the matters here in dispute is certainly to reject both these delusions and seek the truth for ourselves. Geological blunders have been many and frequent, but they are seldom allowed to reach the eyes or ears of those who are duped into believing all this imposing science teaches. The Daily Chronicle of 14th January 1893 speaks pretty plain and proves the truth of the above remarks. The paper says, A Geological Blunder. There is in Nature an article by a French writer on Sir Archibald Geike, Director General of the Geological Survey, which is just now causing a good deal of talk amongst English men of science. Of course, nobody is surprised at the fulsomeness of M. de la Parent's eulogy, as nature seems to exist for pushing the great official scientific syndicate of Huxley, Hooker, Geike, and Co., limited, very strictly limited, which may be said to run science in England. M. de la Perron would probably not have been permitted to write anything about a member of it unless it was fulsome. What has really amazed people is the audacity with which a famous historic bungle on the part of the Geological Survey is glossed over, and the Director General not only credited with the work of those who exposed and corrected it to his utter discomfiture, but actually covered with laurels for thus one of the most glorious scientific conquests of the century. The whole thing is delightfully characteristic of state-endowed science in England. If you are one of the official syndicate who run it, you may blunder with impunity and make your country ridiculous at the taxpayer's expense. Scientific men who can correct you shrink from the task. They know that the syndicate can boycott them, and by intrigue can keep them out of every honor and profit, and that the syndicate satellites can write and shout down everywhere independent, non-official critics. They also know that if, perchance, some particular intrepid person does succeed in exposing one of the syndicate, they can always, by the same means, after the public has forgotten the incident, suppress him and boldly appropriate to themselves the credit of his work. The geological secret of the Highlands, with the unlocking of which Sir Archibald Geike is now credited, was really made a puzzle for more than half a century by the blundering of the Geographical Survey and Director General Sir Roderick Murchison, and famous courtier and society geologist of the last generation. In the highlands he saw gneisses and ordinary crystalline schists resting on Silurian strata, and he foolishly held the sequence to be quite normal. The schists, he would have it, were not archaic formations, but only metamorphosed Silurian deposits. He also held that primitive gneiss was not part of the molten crust of the globe, but only sediments of sand and mud altered by intense pressure and heat. Murchison, not to put too fine a point on it, bounced everybody into accepting this absurd theory, and the whole forces of the geological survey, with its official and social influence, together with the unscrupulous power of the official syndicate which then, as now, jabbed science wherever it had a state endowment, were spent in perpetuating the blunder and blasting the scientific reputation of whoever scoffed at it. But in the natural history school at Aberdeen University it was scoffed at. The late Dr. Nickel, professor of natural history in Aberdeen, proved that Murchison and the survey were wholly wrong, his proof being as complete as the existing state of science allowed. When he died, Dr. Aileen Nicholson took the same side. And for years, in relation to this grand problem, it was Aberdeen University against the world. In shouting the last word, no voice has been louder than Sir Archibald Geike's. It is therefore diverting to find his official biographer stating in nature that all the time he was wrestling in foro consentia with doubts as to the soundness of the official position, and that finally his love of truth prompted him to order a resurvey of the whole Highland region. In plain English, the taxpayer, having had to pay for Murchison's bungling survey, was, because of his successor's love of truth, to enjoy the luxury of paying over again to correct it. The real truth, however, is this. When it was supposed that the Aberdonians were finally crushed, there arose in England a young geologist called Lapworth, who had the courage to revise the whole controversy and take sides with the Aberdeen school. As he developed an extraordinary genius for stratigraphy, he not only broke to pieces the official work of the geological survey in the Highlands, but by revealing the true secret of the structure of that perplexing region, he played havoc with the Murchisons and the Geikies and all their satellites, convicting them of bungling and covering them with ridicule. 
nature, in fact, in these parts, had suffered from a much more powerful emetic than Murchison imagined. And when bits of the primitive crust of the globe were thrown up and pushed on the top of more recent deposits, Murchison jumped to the conclusion that they were of later date than what they lay on. It was a terrible blunder, as the Aberdeen men persistently held, and we do not wonder that Sir Archibald Geike, who rose to place and powered by defending it, is anxious to have his connection with it bailed by a friendly hand. But it is rather outrageous for the friendly hand to give him the credit of conceding the very error which he defended to the last gasp, and deprive Professor Lapworth of the honour of having banished it from science. One of the most diverting things, however, in the article in Nature, is that Sir Archibald Geike is belauded because, when frightened by the stir Professor Lapworth's paper, made in 1883, he was fain to send his surveyors to go over the highlands again. He, as their official chief, ordered them to divest themselves of any prepossession in favour of published views, and to map out the actual facts. Old Colin Campbell, when he objected to the institution of the Victoria Cross, said it was as absurd to decorate a soldier for being brave as a woman for being virtuous. He did not foresee a still greater absurdity, that of eulogizing a man of science because he instructed his assistants to tell the truth when conducting an investigation into his own blunders. From the Daily Chronicle, Saturday, January 14th, 1893. And in a further issue, the same paper says, Sir Archibald Geike, Director General of the Geological Survey, has at last taken notice in nature. We need hardly say of our article condemning the attempt to give the survey all the credit of some of the most remarkable discoveries of the age, of which have really been made by men unaided by the state, in toiling for daily bread as teachers of science. We had heard something that caused us to expose this scandal. The fact is the official ring of state-endowed science, not content with jobbing the Royal Society in it, and its distinctions, as their critics have been showing in the Times, are meditating a raid on the taxpayer. They want more money, and as a preliminary step their official organ, Nature, of course begins to boom their work and reputations. This is a good old game. The only novelty in this situation is that a daily newspaper, for the first time in history, ventured to show it up. We do not desire to be harsh to the illustrious scientists at Nature. It is the duty of all official organs to make big men out of small material. But when they begin to do this by coolly confiscating the achievements of private and independent workers for one of the managing partners of the great firm of Huxley, Geike, Dyer & Co., Limited, we thought it time to protest. The letters that have been appearing in the Times make some funny revelations about the way the Royal Society is worked. Sir Archibald Geike's defense suggests that if the Times only followed up the game it scented, it would show its readers plenty of sport. We ourselves would make no objection to a vote of money in aid of researches into the frank and practical manner in which, and the terms on which, the official gang of science frequently acknowledge the achievements of young outsiders. The Daily Chronicle, Feb. 2, 1893. Modern astronomy has been set down as the most exact of all the sciences, and geology said to be little less than infallible. The reader may form his own conclusions from the above extracts. Circumnavigation is said to be one of the best proofs that the Earth is a globe. It is often asserted, generally, by those who have not the remotest idea of the subject, that ships have sailed round the world on one course, east or west, and come back to the place where they started from. It will be a surprise to such to be informed that this wonderful feat of navigation has never yet been accomplished, that it is most unlikely that it will ever become a fact and that it would take several of the proverbial small fortunes to successfully carry it out. Some people think it is quite an easy matter to start from, say, Liverpool and steer west and come back to the starting point. Suppose we attempt such a journey. After crossing the Atlantic, we must leave the ship and traverse the American continent, as there are no roads running due west but should have to take the sun's bearing almost hourly to keep us on the true course, sometimes having to cross private property, travel through cultivated lands, and in some cases to go through other people's houses to preserve a westerly course. Suppose we arrive at the other side and then took ship across the Pacific. We should again have to travel across the continent, thousands of miles, to get back to the North Sea, and then across it, in England, we might arrive at Liverpool. If anyone thinks this possible, he ought to try it. 
If the reader will scan the surface of a school globe, he will at once see that if such a thing should ever be attempted, no reasonable hope of success could be entertained, unless the attempt were made in the extreme south. Suppose a ship to start from Cape Point, latitude 34 south, and steer east. The first land encountered would be Australia. She would then have to go south to clear the land, and so could not return to her starting point on an easterly course, but would have to take many courses to return there. Let the ship start from Cape Horn, in latitude 56 south, and steer west. She would soon encounter islands and would have to alter her course to north or south to clear them, and so could not get back to Cape Horn on a westerly course. The same would apply on an easterly course. It is evident, therefore, that the earth can only be circumnavigated on one course in the extreme south. There, the dangers of icebergs, of magnitudes never met with in the north, and darkness during a great part of the year, would render such an expedition costly, dangerous, and of long duration. Say a vessel starts on an easterly or westerly course in latitude 65 south. She could only sail during the very finest of summer weather, and would have to come north during the winter. Returning to her last point, she could again start on the course round the world, and continue so long as the fine weather lasted, repeating the process of going north during the dark and winter months. That this would occupy a long time and cost a deal of money is plain enough to anyone willing to be convinced. For these reasons, I am of opinion that no ship will ever sail round the world on one course and come back to her starting point. And yet some globe is the world. One of the greatest feats of navigation will tell you that it has been done scores of times, and proves and seamanship that man could undertake, and which has never yet been attempted, is spoken of as though it were a matter of almost daily occurrence, and who but the astronomers are responsible for such like fallacies in school books and astronomical works? Who but those famed for learned ignorance are answerable for the foolish arrogance and stupid credulity of the masses on this subject? Can there be any truth in a science which is founded on conjecture and supported by so-called facts as proof of its correctness, which facts have never existed outside the brains of their inventors? If it were said that a vessel could sail round the world, allowing for deviations for land, ice, and other obstacles in the way of her making one course, so that by making many and various courses she could at length return to her starting point, I would have no quarrel with the propounders of circumnavigation. But if the general statements on the point were reduced and brought within the compass of fact, in language such as the above, the supposed proof of the world's rotundity would be annihilated. In Evers' navigation, it is stated that a vessel may leave a port, sail round the earth, and come back to her starting point on one course. This I have no hesitation in stating is absolutely false. If otherwise, I should be glad to be informed of the name of the port. The learned are beginning to see through the fallacy of the circumnavigation proof of the world's rotundity. As the following from Elementary Physiography by Professor Richard A. Gregory, FRAS, clearly shows, quote, The earth has been circumnavigated a great many times, and it is a common occurrence for a ship to leave England, and by steering westward all the voyage to arrive in England again without retracing an inch of her way. Similarly, we can journey round the globe, sometimes traveling on land, and sometimes on the sea, but eventually returning to the starting point without at all turning back on our course. This would appear to be a certain proof that the Earth's surface is curved. Nevertheless, it has been pointed out that circumnavigation would be possible if the Earth had a flat surface, with the North Magnetic Pole at its center. A compass needle would then always point to the center of the surface, and so a ship might sail due east and west as indicated by the compass, and eventually return to the same point by describing a circle. D. Wilson Barker, R&R, FRSE, remarks in his work on navigation, quote, The fact that the earth has been sailed round is not sufficient proof as to its exact shape. After these authoritative statements, we may hope that this so-called proof of the globular shape of the earth will soon be expunged from the textbooks. This is written in the 1890s. It has yet to be expunged from the textbooks. We've since had two major world wars and a non-stop conglomeration of other small wars in between. And it doesn't look like the textbooks are anywhere 
close to on their way to changing. Curvature. In Chambers' mathematical tables, the curvature of the globe is given as 7.935 inches to the mile, varying inversely as the square of the distance. If it be required to ascertain the curvature on a globe of 25,000 statute miles equatorial circumference, square the distance and multiply by 7.935 inches. The result is the curvature. Thus, in 6 miles there is a dip of nearly 24 feet and 30 miles nearly 600 feet, and so on. In mensuration by T. Baker, C.E., the correction for curvature is said to be 7.962 inches to the mile. These two equations so nearly agree, and amount to just about what the correction would be on a globe of the size the Earth is said to be, that they may be taken as correct. If, therefore, the world we live on is a globe, it is a simple matter to find out how far any object at a given height can be seen. In September 1898, I received a letter from Australia, in which the writer says, In the year 1872, I was on board the ship Thomas Wood, Captain Gibson from China to London. Owing to making a long passage, we ran shorter provisions, and so short after rounding the Cape, that the captain spoke of putting into St. Helena for a supply. It was then my hobby to get the first glimpse of land, and in order to do this I would go up to the topgallant yard and make a survey just as the sun would be rising. The island was clearly in view, well on the starboard bow. I reported this to Captain Gibson. He disbelieved me, saying it was impossible, as we were seventy-five miles distant. He, however, offered me paper and pencil to sketch the land I saw. This I did. He then said, you are right, and shaped his course accordingly. I had never seen the island before, and could not have described the shape of it had I not seen it. St. Helena is a high volcanic island. If my informant had seen the top only, there would have to be an allowance made for the height of the land. But as he sketched the island, he must have seen the whole of it, which should have been 3,650 feet below the line of sight, if the world be a globe, deducting 100 feet for the height of the yard he viewed it from. In Chambers, Information for the People, Section on Physical Geography, page 59, the following occurs. In North America, the basin or drainage of the Mississippi is estimated at 1,300,000 square miles, and that of the St. Lawrence at 600,000 square miles, while northward of the 50th parallel extends an inhospitable flat of perhaps greater dimensions, so more than 1.3 million square miles or 600,000 square miles north of the 50th parallel extends an inhospitable flat of greater dimensions. Next in order of importance is that section of Europe extending from the German Sea through Prussia, Poland and Russia towards the Ural Mountains, presenting indifferently tracts of heath, sand and open pasture, and regarded by geographers as one vast plain. So flat is the general profile of the region that it has been remarked it is possible to draw a line from London to Moscow which would not perceptibly vary from a dead level. The foregoing is a London to Moscow proof that the surface of the world is not globular. On a globe, no matter how powerful the glass, only a certain distance could be seen as the roundness of the globe would prevent a glass from seeing round it, and its thickness would equally prevent one seeing through it. But in fine weather, objects at distances out of all proportion to what the curvature would allow are visible with the assistance of a good glass. The following from The Voyage of a Naturalist by Charles Darwin, page 166, illustrates this point. The guanaco, or wild lemma, Mr. Stokes told me that he one day saw, through a glass, a herd of these animals which evidently had been frightened, and were running away at full speed, although their distance was so great that he could not distinguish them with the naked eye. From the Atlas of Physical Geography by the Rev. T. Milner, M.A., I extract the following. Vast areas exhibit a perfectly dead level, scarcely a rise existing through 1,500 miles from the Carpathians to the Urals. South of the Baltic, the country is so flat 
that a prevailing north wind will drive the waters of the Statner Half into the mouth of the Oder and give the river a backward flow thirty or forty miles. The plains of Venezuela and New Grenada in South America, chiefly on the left of the Orinoco, are termed Ilanos or level fields. Often in the space of 270 square miles, the surface does not vary a single foot. The Amazon only falls 12 feet in the last 700 miles of its course. The La Plata has only a descent of 1 33rd of an inch a mile. These extracts clearly prove that the surface of the earth is a level surface, and that, therefore, the world is not a globe. And when we come to consider the surface of the world under the sea, we shall find the same uniformity of evidence against the popular view. To 1872, when a British research vessel, HMS Challenger, set out on the first ever mission to map the ocean floor. Throughout most of recorded history, men have just assumed that beyond a certain level, the sea was pretty flat, pretty dead, fairly lifeless. They weren't expecting to find anything very interesting. For four years, the Challenger crisscrossed the oceans, covering 70,000 miles. The crew plumbed the depths every 140 miles, using a total of 249 miles of rope and hundreds of pounds of lead weight. It was tedious, backbreaking work, but at the time it was the only way to measure the depth of the ocean floor. The Challenger expedition marked the birth of modern oceanography and provided the first crude map of the ocean floor. It showed how the ocean floor gently slopes away from the land and then plummets thousands of feet into vast flat plains. Into vast flat plains. In Nature and Man by Professor W. B. Carpenter, article The Deep Sea and Its Contents, pages 320 and 321. The writer says, Nothing seems to have struck the Challenger surveyors more than the extraordinary flatness, except in the neighborhood of land, of that depressed portion of the Earth's crust which forms the floor of the great oceanic area. Quote, Nothing seems to have struck the Challenger surveyors more than the extraordinary flatness of the Earth's crust which forms the floor of the great oceanic area. If the bottom of mid-ocean were laid dry, an observer standing on any spot of it would find himself surrounded by a plain, only comparable to that of the North American prairies or the South American pampas. The form of the depressed area which lodges the water of the deep ocean is rather, indeed, to be likened to that of a flat wader or tea tray, surrounded by an elevated and deeply sloping rim, than to that of the basin with which it is commonly compared. This remarkable writer tells of thousands of miles in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the great southern ocean beds being a plain surface, and from his remarks it is clear that a flat surface is the general contour of the bed of the great oceans for tens of thousands of square miles. Canals If the earth be the globe of popular belief, it is very evident that in cutting a canal, an allowance must be made for the curvature of the globe, which allowance would correspond to the square of the distance multiplied by eight inches, nearly. From the age of 5 August 1893, I extract the following, quote, The German emperor performed the ceremony of opening the gates of the Baltic and North Sea Canal in the spring of 1891. The canal starts at Holtenau, on the south side of Kiel Bay, and joins the Elbe 15 miles above its mouth. It is 61 miles long, 200 feet wide at the surface, and 85 feet at bottom. No locks are required, as the surface of the two seas is level. 
let those who believe it is the practice for surveyors to make allowance for curvature ponder over the following from the Manchester Ship Canal Company, Earth Review, October 1893. It is customary in railway and canal constructions for all levels to be referred to a datum which is nominally horizontal and is so shown on all sections. It is not the practice in laying out public works to make allowance for the curvature of the earth. The Manchester Ship Canal Company, Engineer's Office, 19th February, 1892. A surveyor, Mr. T. Westwood, writes to the Earth Review for January, 1896, as follows. In leveling, I work from ordnance marks or canal levels to get the height above sea level. I work sometimes from what is known as the Wolverhampton level. This is said to be 473.19 feet above sea level. Sometimes I work from the Birmingham level. This is said to be 453.04 feet above sea level. Sometimes I work from the Walsall level. This is said to be 407.89 feet above sea level. The puzzle to me used to be that, though each extends several miles, each level was and is treated throughout its whole length as the same level from end to end, not the least allowance being made for curvature, although if the earth were a globe, 112 feet ought to be allowed. One of the civil engineers in this district, after some amount of argument on each side as to the reason why no allowance for curvature was made, said he did not believe anybody would know the shape of the earth in this life. I think most will grant that a practical man is capable of forming a judgment in all cases of more value than the merely theoretical calculator. Here then we have the evidence of practical men to the effect that no allowance for curvature is made in cutting canals, a clear proof that we are not living on a huge ball, but on a surface, the general contour of which is level, as the datum line from which surveys are made is always a horizontal line. Disappearances of Ships at Sea J. W. Draper, in his Conflict Between Religion and Science, page 160, says, The circular, visible horizon and its dip at sea, the gradual appearance and disappearance of ships in the offing, cannot fail to incline intelligent sailors to a belief in the globular form of the earth. The circular, visible horizon amounts to nothing because if we take our stand in a large square of, say, 20 miles, the visible horizon will be circular, any point in the distance being the edge of the circle of vision. If we measure off a square of 100 miles or so, the vision will be bounded by a circle, the limit of sight, so the circular visible horizon may at once be dismissed. But its dip at sea is just what has never been seen. It is the very thing that requires to be seen to establish the globular theory. Wherever we look at sea, the water extends in one straight line, as far as the eye can reach. A flat surface is always seen, and ships are seen at distances altogether out of proportion to the allowance to be made for convexity, if the surface were a convex one. When a ship or any other object recedes from the observer on a level surface, the highest part is always seen last by reason of perspective, so that the masts and sails of a receding vessel on a flat surface should be seen long after the hull has become invisible to the naked eye. Besides this law of perspective, the hull of a vessel is generally of a dark color and often at a very short distance disappears to the naked eye because it has lost its individuality in the mass of surrounding water, both hull and water being nearly of the same color. It appears to have mingled with the water and is thus lost to sight. The hull has no background whatever, but the masts and sails have a splendid background against the sky, and stand out to advantage and are, for this reason also, seen long after the hull has vanished. But that the hull has not gone down behind a hill of water, 
that it is not because of the globular surface of the water that it is invisible, has been proved by the writer many times. At Cape Town some time ago I made special experiments with a view to arrive at the truth of the matter. On one occasion I watched the schooner Lilla of Cape Town sail away north, bound to Saldana Bay. Instead of gradually going down the hill of water, the observer always being on the highest part, she appeared to ascend an inclined plane until she reached the level of my eye, perhaps one hundred feet above sea level, and then gradually diminished in size. Soon her hull disappeared, it was painted black, and her masts and sails became smaller and smaller every minute. I then applied a binocular to the eye, and saw her hull plainly enough. It remained in sight until the individuality of the vessel's parts were lost in the distance. The iron bark La Querida of Liverpool sailed out of the table bay bound to Australia. I watched her until the hull had completely disappeared, but, on applying the glass, saw it as clearly as possible, and this when the vessel was at least ten miles away, so that the hill of water in both these instances was imaginary only. In May 1895, I was a passenger on board the USS Goth. In Algoa Bay, I gave a brief lecture on the subject of this work, and had much discussion with some of the passengers, one affirming he could believe all I said, with the exception of the way I accounted for the disappearance of ships at sea. I replied that we would likely see one of the ships, and then it could be tested. Next day, I observed a vessel about ten miles away, but though the masts and sails were pretty clear, the hull was not to be seen. Applying the glass, I saw the hull, as plain as any other part of the ship. I called the gentleman with whom I had the previous day's conversation, and showed him the vessel. I asked him to look at the ship for some time, so as to be quite sure whether the hull was visible or not. After looking a minute or so, he was quite certain that the hull could not be seen. I asked him why it was invisible. Because, he said, it is hidden behind a hill of water, the surface of the ocean being convex. I asked him if he believed my glass could see through a hill of water, and gave him the astronomer's curvature for the distance, which he admitted to be ten miles, as ten by ten by eight inches equals sixty-six feet, less twenty feet for height of eye and ten feet for height of the other vessel's hull equals thirty-six feet, the hull should have been below the water. He replied that the glass could not, of course, see through a hill of water, and applied it to his eye. Great was his astonishment on seeing the hull, but equally ready was his confession that the theory of the earth's rotundity, founded on the disappearance of ships at sea, was false. On a steamer in March 1897, when near St. Helena, my attention was called to a large vessel, just before sunset. With the naked eye the masts and sails were visible enough, but nothing of the hull could be seen. On applying the glass there, there appeared to be no difference, and I was for some time lost in wonder. But as the sun got lower in the heavens I noticed that the vessel's hull was overshadowed by banks of black clouds low down on the water, and thus could not be seen. The hull was enveloped in dense blackness and was lost to the eye, but as soon as the sun was low enough to counteract this effect, I saw the hull quite plain with the glass, when only the sails were visible to the naked eye. Between Tenerife and Southampton we sighted a large four-masted steamer astern of us. The hull was also plainly to be seen. The vessel appeared to be in ballast. Our ship's officers said she was twelve miles away, and I think the distance was not less. For two whole days she was visible to us astern, sometimes the hull being quite plain, at other times being invisible, thus proving that the state of the atmosphere has more to do with the matter than globularity, if it existed, could have. According to the globe theory, an object plainly visible to the naked eye, and seen by scores of people, should have been ninety-six feet below the horizon, allowing both vessels to be the same height above the water, which was as near as possible correct, as our ship had scarcely any cargo on board and presented a high side out of the water. Another Witness Quote, To the Editor of the Earth Review Sir, in August last, 
I, with several other friends, being in Oban for a holiday, took a trip for a day in a small yacht on Loch Lorne, and being a glorious sunshiny day and so calm that not a ripple was seen, and being becalmed for an hour about midday, we observed a good many sights of various kinds. Amongst other things that we saw was a yacht, which the captain told us was twelve miles distant. We saw all the masts and part of the hull, and to get a better view of her, we took our binocular opera glass, a good one. Now, sir, wouldn't it require a funny curvature table either with or without the odd fractions to explain how we saw the hull of that vessel twelve miles off? According to a table furnished by the present Astronomer Royal recently, it ought to have been sixty-six feet below the line of sight. But the table that we saw it from was the side of our yacht, and we concluded the sea was level. Yours respectfully, John Smith, Siddle Halifax. The following is from 100 Proofs That the Earth Is Not a Globe. If we take a trip down the Chesapeake Bay in the daytime, we may see for ourselves the utter fallacy of the idea that when a vessel appears hull down, as it is called, it is because the hull is behind the water. For vessels have been seen and may often be seen again, presenting the appearance spoken of in a way far away beyond those vessels, and at the same moment the level shoreline with its accompanying complement of tall trees towering up in perspective over the heads of the hull-down ships. The following is from Chambers' Journal of February 1895, page 32. A good many years ago, a pilot in the Mauritius reported that he had seen a vessel which turned out to be 200 miles off. This incident caused a great deal of discussion in nautical circles at the time, and, strange to say, a seemingly well-authenticated case of the same kind occurred afterwards at Aden. A pilot there announced that he had seen from the heights the Bombay steamer then nearly due. He stated precisely the direction in which he saw her, and added that her head was not then turned towards the port. Two days afterwards the missing steamer entered the port, and it was found on inquiries that at the time mentioned by the pilot she was exactly in the direction and position indicated by him, but about two hundred miles away. Under exceptional conditions of the atmosphere, therefore, enormous distances can be penetrated by the unaided eye, and with a good telescope, objects at distances totally out of proportion to the globular theory can be seen. Take the case of the above steamer. If the globe theory be correct, this vessel would have been four miles below the line of sight, allowing one mile for height of observer, and thus, even when aided by the most powerful telescope ever invented, could not have been seen. Once more, it dawns on the thinking man that the world is not the globe of, pot of popular credulity, but an extended, motionless plane. Distances if the world be a globe, the distances which are sailed by ships sailing round the globe would answer to the theory, and measurements as made by such ships would always answer to the theoretical distances of the astronomer. That such is not the case, as I shall presently show, disproves the theory. First, let us inquire how distances are obtained, say in sailing on an easterly or westerly course. In obtaining the longitude by dead reckoning, an allowance for the supposed convergence or shorter longitude according to the latitude, would have to be made, when the result obtained should not vary much from the longitude obtained by observation. When currents have to be reckoned with, the allowance for their known velocity in any direction would bring the result of the dead reckoning up to that obtained by observation, always remembering that if a ship is steering east, for example, the allowance for the direction of the current cannot be the same as would have to be made by a vessel in the same latitude steering west. If the allowance for currents be made in the same direction when the ship is steering west as when she is steering east, it is very evident that this is done to bring the theoretical result into line with the actual facts. Navigators are often at a loss to account for the great differences between dead reckoning, even when the allowance for currents has been made, and the ship's position as obtained by observation. Believing that they are sailing on a globular surface, Nothing presents itself to the mind but the usual theories by which they unsuccessfully endeavor to account for their discrepancy. Did they know that the surface of the ocean is a plain surface? They ought to know this. Something new would present itself for consideration, theories would be abandoned, 
an investigation instituted. The result could not fail to be advantageous to navigation generally. In South Sea Voyages by Sir James C. Ross, Volume 1, page 96, states, We found ourselves every day from 12 to 18 miles by observation in advance of our reckoning. Page 27, By our observations at noon we found ourselves 58 miles to the eastward of our reckoning in two days. Quote, Voyage Towards the South Pole by Captain Jazz Weddell states, By... Quote, Feb 11th at noon, in latitude 65 degrees 53 minutes south, our chronometers gave 44 miles more westing than the log in three days. Lieutenant Wilkes says that in less than 18 hours he was 20 miles to the east of his reckoning, in latitude 54 degrees 20 minutes south. In Anson's Voyage Round the World by R. Walter, page 76, the following statement is made. It was indeed most wonderful that the current should have driven us to the eastward with such strength, for the whole squadron esteemed themselves upwards of ten degrees more westerly than this land, the Straits of Magellan, so that in running down, by our account, about nineteen degrees of longitude, we had not really advanced half that distance. Captain Woodside of the American Barkentine Echo at Cape Town on 26 June 1898 reports that on 12 January 1896, being without observation for two days and going 250 miles a day on a straight course, he expected to be 100 miles south and a long way to the eastward of Gough Island in latitude 40 degrees south, but was startled to find his ship making straight for the island and barely escaped shipwreck. The Falino Winslow was wrecked there 25 years ago, and there were remains of numerous other wrecks. The fact that in sailing either east or west the currents are allowed the same way proves that the rotundity idea is the factor which effectually debars our navigators from obtaining a correct solution of the difficulty. Let it be acknowledged that, as the surface of all standing water is level, the world is a plane and not a globe. An investigation may be instituted into the causes of the discrepancies to which we have alluded. But so long as the globular idea prevails, so long will it be impossible for the navigator to arrive at the truth of the matter. I have further weight of evidence on this important branch of our subject. By comparing the theoretical measurements of the supposed globe with the distances actually made in sailing, these data which I now submit prove clearly to any unprejudiced mind that the world cannot be the globe of astronomical imagination, but that it is an outstretched circular plane without axial or orbital motion. Sir Robert Ball in his Story of the Heavens, page 163, informs the reader that the dimensions of the earth are known with a high degree of accuracy. This writer is recognized as an able exponent of globular hypothesis, and it is generally conceded that what he says may be regarded as correct. He's like the Neil deGrasse High Tyson of his day. Let us now inquire what high degree of accuracy the dimensions of the earth are known. If the earth be the globe it is generally said to be, it is evident that the further we go south from the equator, the smaller will the circles be, and no circle south of the equator could be equal to that at the equator. The S.S. Nidsdale of Glasgow, Captain Haddon, sailed from Hamelin Bay in Western Australia on 8th January 1898, arriving at Port Natal on 1st February 1898, having steamed 4,519 nautical miles. Her log, of which the chief officer, Mr. Boyle, also a past master, kindly gave me a copy, shows that she did not make quite a ROM line track. Hamelin Bay is in latitude 34 degrees south, and longitude 115 degrees, 5 minutes east. Port Natal is situate in latitude 29 degrees south, 53 minutes south, and 31 degrees, 4 minutes east longitude. The difference of latitude being so small, we shall not get far out if we take the middle latitude, these 32 degrees south. The difference of longitude is 84 degrees, 1 minute, or 4.28 of the complete circle of 360 degrees round the world. 
Something must be added to the ship's log so as to bring the distance up to the ROM line track, say 100 miles. Therefore, to find the distance round the world at 32 degrees south, it is only necessary to solve the following problem. As 84 degrees 1 minute is to 360 degrees is to 4,619 nautical or 5,390 statute miles is to x. The answer equals 23,000 miles nearly. This is several thousand miles in excess of what the distance would or could be on a globe. And further south on a globe, the distance should be less. In the cruise of HMS Challenger by WJJ Spry, the distance made good from the Cape of Good Hope to Melbourne is stated to be 7,637 miles. The Cape is in latitude 34 degrees 21 minutes south and Melbourne in latitude 37 degrees south. The longitude of the Cape being 18 degrees 30 minutes east and Melbourne 145 or 14.5 degrees east. The middle latitude is 35 and a half degrees. The difference of longitude 126 and a half degrees which makes the distance round the world at that latitude 35 and a half degrees to be over 25,000 statute miles and as great as the equator is said to be. Thus we see on reliable evidence that the further we go south the greater is the distance round the world. This latter distance is many thousand miles more than the purely theoretical measurement of the world at that latitude south. From the same work, we find the distance from Sydney to Wellington to be 1,432 miles. The middle latitude is 37 and a half degrees, and the difference of longitude 23 degrees 36 minutes, which gives as the distance round the world at latitude 37 and a half degrees south, 25,500 statute miles. This distance is again greater than the greatest distance round the globe is said to be and many thousands of miles greater than could be the case on a globe. Thus, on purely practical data, apart from any theory, the world is proved to diverge as the south is approached, and not to converge as it would do on a globe. Fluids It is in the nature of fluids to be and remain level. And when that level is disturbed by any influence whatever, motion ensues until the level is resumed. Professor Airy tells us in his six lectures on astronomy that quicksilver is perfectly fluid. Its surface is perfectly horizontal. We may add that all fluids are the same for the reason given by the next writer. Mr. W. T. Lynn of the Royal Observatory, Greenwich, or Grenick, in his first principles of natural philosophy says the upper surface of a fluid at rest is a horizontal plane because if a part of the surface were higher than the rest those parts of the fluid which were under it would exert a greater pressure upon the surrounding parts than they receive from them so that motion would take place amongst the particles and continue until there were none at a higher level than the rest that is until the upper surface of the whole mass of fluid became a horizontal plane. The English mechanic of 26 June 1896 says, quote, Since any given body of water must have a level surface, i.e. no one part higher than another, and seeing that all our oceans, a few inland seas excepted, are connected together, it follows that they are all virtually of the same level. In March 1870, the Bedford Canal was chosen to experiment upon with a view of determining whether water was horizontal or convex. The following argument is taken from the report, as printed in The Field for 26 March 1870, and is considered to be sufficient and unanswerable. The stations appeared, to all intents and purposes, equidistant in the field of view, and also in a regular series. First, the distant bridge, secondly, the central signal, and thirdly, the horizontal crosshair marking the point of observation, showing that the central disc, 13 feet 4 inches high, 
does not depart from a straight line taken from end to end of the six miles in any way whatever, either laterally or vertically. For, if so, and as in the case of the disk nine feet four inches high, if it were lower or nearer the water, it would appear as that disk does, nearer to the distant bridge. If it were higher, it would appear in the opposite direction, nearer the horizontal crosshair, which marks the point of observation. As the disk four feet lower appears near to the distant bridge, so a disk to be really five feet higher would have to appear still nearer to the horizontal crosshair of the telescope. And therefore it is shown that a straight line from one point to the other passes through the central point in its course, and that a curved surface of water has not been demonstrated. There's quite an interesting note about this portion. I'll read the article to you later. I'll read it in at some point to this movie, where it actually describes what they call a great naturalist being drawn into this uh, discussion and into the Bedford Canal and into bets that they made and the actual recording of his drawings in Field, printed in the Field magazine. And you can see that they try to claim that it was an unsuccessful test and you'll see some really interesting, funny things there. It's proven, again, that it's perfectly flat. And actually, court cases were won on Samuel Robotham's part and on others' parts that proved that the water was flat. However, newspapers and other media sources at the time made the exact opposite statements and put out bold-faced lies claiming that the Bedford level had been proven to be wrong and that they had been proven uh, to have lost their bets at the Bedford level when the exact opposite was shown to be the truth. It wasn't long after the Bedford level that that Robotham was run out of the country and very shortly soon after that run out of his life. So we'll come back to that. In Theoretical Astronomy, page 47, it is stated, On the Royal Observatory wall at Greenwich, or at Greenwich, is a brass plate which states that a certain horizontal mark is 154 feet above mean water at Greenwich and 155.7 feet above mean water at Liverpool. The difference of the level between Liverpool and Greenwich is thus shown to be only 1.7 feet. If the world were a globe, the difference of level would be many thousands of feet. It is a common saying that water will find its level, and it is true. If water be dammed back, it will, as soon as released, take the easiest course to where it can find its level. The following from the Natal Mercury of 24th October, 1898, fully illustrates this point. A mountain of water. Quote, London, October 19, Digger's News Special. The steamer Blanche Rock, whilst entering the Morpeth Dock, Birkenhead, burst the dock gates. The water inside, which was eight feet higher than the level of the river, rushed out with tremendous force. The swirling mass of water damaged the shipping and beached and sank a number of barges. Two lives were lost. As soon as the water got to the level of the river, its power would cease. Charles Darwin, in his Voyage of a Naturalist, page 328, tells us, I was reminded of the Pampas of Buenos Aires by seeing the disk of the rising sun, intersected by an horizon level as that of the ocean. A globe with level oceans would be a new thing in geography. Figure of the Earth In The History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science by J.W. Draper, page 153, we are informed that an uncritical observation of the aspect of nature persuades us that the earth is an extended level surface which sustains the dome of the sky, a firmament dividing the waters above from the waters beneath, that the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, pursue their way, moving from east to west their insignificant size and motion round the motionless earth proclaiming their inferiority. Of the various organic forms surrounding man, none rival him in dignity. 
and hence he seems justified in concluding that everything has been created for his use. The sun for the purpose of giving him light by day, the moon and stars by night. A critical observation of nature, I may say, persuades an intelligent and unbiased mind that seeing is believing, and that, therefore, the world is not the globe of modern ideas. Dr. Draper further tells us on page 156 of his book, quote, Many ages previously a speculation had been brought from India to Europe by Pythagoras. It presented the sun as the center of the system. Around him the planets revolved in circular orbits, their order of position being Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, each of them being supposed to rotate on its axis as it revolved around the sun. Aristarchus adopted the Pythagorean system as representing the actual facts. This was the result of a recognition of the sun's amazing distance, and therefore of his enormous size. The heliocentric system, thus regarding the sun as the central orb, degraded the earth to a very subordinate rank, making her only one of a company of six revolving bodies. This speculation, afterward this is, has been shown in the foregoing pages to be without the slightest foundation in fact, and the world shown to be a plane and not a globe. In Modern Science and Modern Thought by S. Lang, the following imaginative proof of the globular figure of the Earth is brought forward. If, for instance, by traveling 65 miles from north to south, we lower the apparent height of the pole star one degree, it is mathematically certain that we have traveled this 65 miles, not along a flat surface, but along a circle, which is 360 times 65, or, in round numbers, 24,000 miles in circumference, and 8,000 miles in diameter, and that the form of the Earth is a perfect sphere of these dimensions. And on pages 162 and 163, the following is the continuation of the same ridiculous argument. Until the Cape was doubled, the course of da Gama's ships was in a general manner southward. Very soon it was noticed that the elevation of the pole star above the horizon was diminishing and soon after the equator was reached the star had ceased to be visible. Meantime other stars, some of them forming magnificent constellations, had come into view, the stars of the southern hemisphere. All this was in conformity to theoretical expectation founded on the admission of the globular form of the earth. If we select a flat street a mile long, containing a row of lamps, it will be noticed that from where we stand the lamps gradually decline to the ground, the last one being apparently quite on the ground. Take the lamp at the end of the street and walk away from it a hundred yards, and it will appear to be much nearer the ground than when we were close to it. Keep on walking away from it, and it will appear to be gradually depressed, until it is last seen on the ground, and then disappears. Now, According to the astronomers, the whole mile was only depressed about eight inches from one end to the other, so that this eight inches could not account for the enormous depression of the light as we recede from it. This proves that the depression of the pole star can and does take place in relation to a flat surface, simply because we increase our distance from it, the same as from a street lamp. In other words, the farther away we get from any object above us, as a star for example, the more it is depressed along the horizon, and if we go far enough it will sink or appear to sink to the horizon and then disappear. The writer has tried the street lamp many times with the same result. Growth of the Earth R. A. Proctor in his work Our Place Among Infinities, pages 9 and 10, tells us that the Earth was once a mass of glowing vapor. Capturing then as now, but far more actively then than now, masses of matter which approached near enough and growing by these continual indrafts from without, all that is within and upon the earth are formed of materials which have been drawn in from these depths of space surrounding us on all sides, particles drawn in towards the earth by processes continuing millions and millions of ages. This is written with as much authority as the writer could have had, had he been present when the supposed spark was shot off from the sun. He writes as though he had carefully watched the spark grow bigger, age by age, until it assumed the proportions it had when it began to cool down. 
He tells his story as though he had been an eyewitness of all the supposed processes during all the supposed countless ages until protoplasm made its appearance and life began to evolve upon the supposed globe. The reader is made to understand from the scientific manner in which the mythical storyteller unfolds his mythical tale that he, the retailer of the story, carefully watched the evolution of the earth until the time came when the astronomers were able to tell us without the fear of contradiction, that the earth actually had taken all these millions of ages to evolve into its present form and size. Marvelous, is it not, and how very scientific, to be sure. The reader may pass over the whole of the foregoing extract from the pen of the greatest astronomer of the age, for there is not one word of truth in it. It is the product of a fertile imagination, nothing more. The world is much the same now as it was in the days of our grandfathers. Only the people now are more infidel than they were in those days. And since its creation, it has not greatly altered, except that it, as it has been altered by the universal flood in the time of that righteous man Noah. The flood disturbed the strata of the earth and broke up its layers. Hence we find the bones of men and animals beneath the crust, which fact causes infidel scientists who are seeking a proof of the untruth of the Bible, to believe that the earth is many millions of ages old, and therefore not the earth of the creation as recorded in Genesis. The poet Cowper has well said, Hear the just law, the judgment of the skies. He that hates truth shall be the dupe of lies, and he that will be cheated to the last, delusion strong as hell, shall bind him fast. Gravitation the law of gravitation is said by the advocates of the Newtonian system of astronomy to be the greatest discovery of science, and the foundation of the whole of modern astronomy. If, therefore, it can be shown that gravitation is a pure assumption, and an imagination of the mind only, that it has no existence outside of the brains of its expounders and advocates, the whole of the hypothesis of this modern so-called science fall to the ground as flat as the surface of the ocean. And this most exact of all the sciences, this wonderful feat of the intellect, becomes at once the most ridiculous superstition and the most gigantic imposture to which ignorance and credulity could ever be exposed. In The Story of the Heavens by Sir R. Ball, it is stated on page 82, The Law of Gravitation the greatest discovery that science has yet witnessed. The law of gravitation, which underlies the whole of astronomy. Page 101. The law of gravitation announces that every body in the universe attracts every other body with a force which varies inversely with the square of the distance. Popular Science Recreations by G. Tizandier pages 486 and 487, contains the following. Gravitation is the force which keeps the planets in their orbits. Every object in the world tends to attract every other object in proportion to the quantity of matter of which each consists. Professor W. B. Carpenter in his work Nature and Man, page 365, says, The laws of light and gravitation, wrote Mr. Atkinson to Harriet Martineau, thirty years ago, extend over the universe and explain whole classes of phenomena, and this explanation, according to the same writer, is all-sufficient. Philosophy finding no god in nature, nor seeing the want of any. C. Vernon Boys, FRS, ARSM, MRI, in his paper, The Newtonian Constant of Gravitation, says, G. represents that mighty principle under the influence of which every star planet and satellite in the universe pursues its allotted course. Unlike any other known physical influence, it is independent of medium. It knows no refraction. It cannot cast a shadow. It is a mysterious power, which no man can explain. Of its propagation through space, all men are ignorant. I cannot contemplate this mystery at which we ignorantly wonder without thinking of the altar on Mars's hill. When will a St. Paul arise able to declare it unto us? Or is gravitation, like life, 
a mystery that can never be solved. Proceedings of the Royal Institution of Great Britain, March 1895, page 355. Professor W. B. Carpenter, in his paper Nature and Law, published in the Modern Re Review for October 1890, says, The first of the great achievements of Newton in relation to our present subject was a piece of purely geometrical reasoning. Assuming two forces to act on a body, of which one should be capable of imparting to it uniform motion in a straight line, whilst the other should attract it towards a fixed point in accordance with Galileo's law of gravity, he demonstrated that the path of the body would be deflected into a curve. The idea of continuous onward motion in a straight line, as the resultant of an original impulsive force not antagonized or affected by any other, formularized by Newton as his first law of motion, is not borne out by any acquired experience, and does not seem likely to be ever thus verified. For in no experiment we have it in our power to make can we entirely eliminate the antagonizing effects of friction and atmospheric resistance. And thus all movement that is subject to this retardation and is not sustained by any fresh action of the impelling force must come to an end. Hence the conviction commonly entertained that Newton's first law of motion must be true cannot be philosophically admitted to be anything more than a probability. We have no proof, and in the nature of things can never get one, of the assumption of the attractive force exerted by the earth, or by any of the bodies of the solar system, upon other bodies at a distance. Newton himself strongly felt that the impossibility of rationally accounting for action at a distance through an intervening vacuum was the weak point of his system. All that we can be said to know is that which we learn from our own experience. Now in regard to the sun's attraction for the earth and planets, we have no certain experience at all. Unless we could be transported to its surface, we have no means of experimentally comparing solar gravity with terrestrial gravity. And, if we could ascertain this, we should be no nearer the determination of its attraction for bodies at a distance. The doctrine of universal gravitation, then, is a pure assumption. In Letters to the British Association, Professor Bernstein says, The theory that motions are produced through material attraction is absurd. Attributing such a power to mere matter, which is passive by nature, is a supreme illusion. It is a lovely and easy theory to satisfy any man's mind. But when the practical test comes, it fails and falls all to pieces and becomes one of the most ridiculous theories to common sense and judgment. The following extracts are taken from A Million of Facts by Sir Richard Phillips. If the sun has, quote, if the sun has any power, it must be derived from motion, and if acting on bodies at a distance, like Jupiter on his moons, or the earth on its moon, there must be an intervening medium to conduct its momentum through its system. It is a principle never to be lost sight of that circular motion is a necessary result of equal action and reaction in contrary directions, for the harmony would be disturbed by variation of distance if the motion were rectilinear. The same action and reaction are therefore only to be preserved by reciprocal circular motion. No attraction and no projectile force are therefore necessary. Their invention must be regarded as blunders of a superstitious age. If the bodies came near while moving the same way, there would be no mutual reaction and they would go together for want of reaction, and not owing to that mechanical impossibility called attraction. To accommodate the hypothetical law of universal gravitation to the phenomena of the planets, astronomers have referred to change the mean density of matter itself, and the Earth, for comparison, being taken at a density of 1,000 to accommodate Mercury to the assumed law, it is taken as 2,585, Venus 1,024, Mars 656, Jupiter 201, Saturn 103, and Herschel 218. 
Consequently, we have the paradox that Jupiter, 1,290 times larger than the Earth, contains but 323 times more atoms. Saturn, 1,107 times larger, but 114 times more atoms? Even the Sun, according to these theorists, is but one-fourth the density of the Earth. There may be differences, but chemistry and all the laws that unite and compound atoms are utterly at variance with so rash and wild an hypothesis. It is a waste of time to break a butterfly on a wheel, but as astronomy and all sciences beset with fancies about attraction and repulsion, it is necessary to eradicate them. If there are two bodies, and it is required to move A to C, the force moving A to C must proceed from the side A. Either some impact or some involvement of a motion towards C must act at A to carry A to C. The modern schools, however, assert that B may move A to C, and A move B to C, and this is mutual attraction. Hence, it is necessary to believe that B acts on the side A where B is not present, and that A acts on B on the side B where A is not present. In other words, A is required to be where it is not, and also B in force at A, so as to move B to C, all of which is absurd. If in any case A and B approach, it is not because A moves B towards itself, or B moves A towards itself, but owing to some causes which affect the space, in which A and B are situated, and which causes act on A at A and on B at B. The statement that A moves B and B moves A is ignorance, and is what is meant by attraction. It is also worse than ignorance to justify idleness by asserting that the true cause is indifferent, or to justify ignorance by asserting that it is unknowable. This reasoning applies to every species of attraction whatever may be the pomposity of equivocal terms in which it is described. Universally, bodies cannot push other bodies towards themselves. If A and B are said to repel one another, and that B makes A move to C, and A makes B move to D, we have to bear in mind that while A is moving to C, it is in force only in that direction, and cannot, therefore, be moving B towards D. In like manner, while B is moving to D, it is in force only in that direction, and cannot therefore be in force in the contrary direction, so as to move A to C. Every species and variety of attraction and repulsion are therefore absurd. Matter is in all cases the conductor of motion. If a body moves, it is because it is the patient of some sufficient momentum of body or matter acting on the side from which the body moves and only in force in that direction. Some adopters of attraction, etc., talk by false analogy of drawing, others of pulling, lifting, etc. Laplace invents gravitating atoms and gives them a velocity of 6,000 times that of light, which in some way, known only to himself, performs the work of bringing the body in. Others imagine little hooks, as to drawing, pulling, etc., it behooves them to show the tackle, the levers, the ropes, etc. In spite of all the learning, ingenuity, and elaborations of men, confessedly very able, if there is not and cannot be any action of the nature of attraction, and if the phenomena ascribed to it are local effects of palpable local causes, and if all the phenomena and involvement may be clearly explained on different principles, then it may be to be lamented that so much ability and character should have been wasted, while a respect for truth and sound reasoning demands that the whole should be forgotten as a dream or demolished as a card house. Professor Airy, in his Lectures on Astronomy, 5th edition, page 194, informs us, Newton was the first person who made a calculation of the figure of the Earth on the theory of gravitation. He took the following supposition as the only one to which his theory could be applied. He assumed the Earth to be a fluid. This fluid matter he assumed to be equally dense in every part. 
For trial of his theory, he supposed the assumed fluid earth to be a spheroid. In this manner, he inferred that the form of the earth would be a spheroid, in which the length of the shorter is to the longer, or equatorial diameter, in, in the proportion of 229 to 230. The New Principia by N. Crossland contains the following. In ascending a hill, we experience a hard struggle and feel more fatigue than when walking on level ground. Why is this? Newtonian attributes this to the attraction of gravitation of the Earth, against the pull of which we have to contend. But if he would be consistent with his theory that the attraction of gravitation diminishes inversely as the square of the distance from the center of the Earth, we ought, in defiance of experience, to feel it to be less laborious to ascend a hill than to promenade the same distance on level ground. Because as we ascend, we recede from the center of the Earth, and therefore the force of gravitation ought to diminish in a corresponding degree. The Newtonian can only get over this difficulty by a species of scientific quibbling. According to the definition of weight I have given, the solution of the problem is perfectly simple. In ascending a hill, a man comes in conflict with the law that the natural tendency of any body is to seek the easiest and shortest route to its level of stability. He chooses the very reverse, and must therefore endure the consequences of acting in opposition to this law. At every step he has to lift his own weight, and the higher he mounts the more he feels the influence of the law which he defies. His easiest and more direct course to obey the law of weight is to remain where he is. The next is to descend to a lower level. The attraction of gravitation is said to be stronger at the surface of the earth than at a distance from it. Is it so? If I spring upwards perpendicularly, I cannot ascend more than four feet from the ground. But if I jump in a curve with a low trajectory, keeping my highest elevation, about three feet, I might clear out a bound a space above the earth of eighteen feet, so that practically I can overcome the so-called force or pull at the distance of four feet in the proportion of eighteen to four, being the very reverse of what I ought to be able to do according to the Newtonian hypothesis. Again, take the case of a shot propelled from a cannon. By the force of the explosion and the influence of the reputed act of gravitation, the shot forms a parabolic curve, and finally falls to the earth. Here we may ask why, if the forces are the same, viz. direct impulse and gravitation, does not the shot form an orbit like that of a planet, and revolve around the earth? The Newtonian may reply, because the impulse which propelled the shot is temporary, and the impulse which propelled the planet is permanent. Precisely so. But why is the impulse permanent in the case of the planet revolving the sun? What is the cause of this permanence? We are asked by the Newtonian to believe that the action of gravitation, which we can easily overcome by the slightest exercise of volition in raising a hand or a foot, is so overwhelmingly violent when we lose our balance and fall, a distance of a few feet, that this force, which is imperceptible under usual conditions, may, under extraordinary circumstances, cause the fracture of every limb we possess, Common sense must reject this interpretation. Gravitation does not furnish a satisfactory explanation of the phenomena here described, whereas the definition of weight already given does. For a body seeking in the readiest manner its level of stability would produce precisely the results experienced. If the influence which kept us securely attached to this earth were identical with that which is powerful enough to disturb a distant planet in its orbit, should be more immediately conscious of its masterful presence and potency, whereas this influence is so impotent in the very spot where it is supposed to be the most dominant that we find an insurmountable difficulty in accepting the idea of its existence. Fortunately for our faculty of locomotion, the Newtonian hypothesis may be rejected as a snare and a delusion. It is quite amusing to watch Newtonians and Darwinians floundering about in their attempts to expound the mysteries of creation. Their theories are as ridiculous as the fashion which once prevailed for Delacruscan poetry, and they ought to be treated with equal severity.
It seems quite possible that during the last 200 years we have been living in a sort of scientific fool's paradise, and that universal gravitation is a gigantic Newtonian mare's nest. As a theoretical scientific guide, we must give up Sir Isaac Newton as useless and misleading, and allow his reputation to retire into private life. In knowledge of the 17th and 24th February, 1882, there appeared a discourse on The Birth of the Moon by Tidal Evolution by Dr. Ball, the Astronomer Royal for Ireland, which I should say is without exception the most delusive and absurd contribution ever made to so-called science. At one time I thought that Parallax, who told us that the Earth was a flat plane like a plate, was the most misguided man in the kingdom but I now believe that he is quite entitled to take rank in scientific wisdom and to sit down on an equality with the Astronomer Royal of Dublin. I have quoted at length on this important matter, and the evidence here produced, besides very much more in the same direction, for which I have not the space here, shows clearly that there is no such force as gravitation in existence anywhere. One of the world's so-called great thinkers, J.S. Mill, is quoted in Professor Carpenter's Nature and Man, page 385, as saying, Although we speak of a man's fall as caused by the slipping of his foot, or the breaking of a rung, as the case may be, the efficient cause is the attractive force of the earth, which the loss of support to the man's foot brings into operation. If a man is not deeper than to believe what this deep thinker has left on record in this matter, if he has no more brain power than to accept the foregoing statement, I would strongly advise him to cease thinking altogether, and thus save the few brains he has. It is simply astounding that men, who in business matters are sharp enough, are as dull as bricks and as credulous as children when the awe-inspiring subject of gravitation, that grand masterpiece of astronomy, is the theme. To ask the reason why, or to venture to suggest that the assumptions of the learned require some sort of proof to back them up, never seems to strike moderns who believe in this monstrous humbug. A. Gibburn, in Sun, Moon, and Stars, page 27, says, If the sun is pulling with such power at the earth, and all her sister planets, why do they not fall down upon him? A very proper question, truly. And when this question is propounded to astronomers, they cannot give an answer worth recording. They simply do not know how to answer the question without stultifying their common sense. But the above writer thinks it can be answered. So says, Did you ever tie a ball to a string and swing it rapidly round and round your head? If you did, you must have noticed the steady outward pull of the ball. The steady outward pull of the ball clearly implies that the ball has intelligence and knows just what to do so as to prevent its hitting the head of the operator. The outward pull of a ball, which is fastened to the hand of the operator by a string, is clearly impossible. If the operator ceased to impel it round and round his head by the mechanical attachment, and the power he exerts in swinging it round, the ball would seek its level of stability and fall to the ground. And as this illustration is used to teach what gravitation is, and how it acts, we shall just follow the illustration to its logical conclusion and see where the theory is. The illustration implies that between all the bodies in the universe, there is a connecting link like a string which keeps the body that attracts attached to the body that is attracted. This connecting link in the case of the ball is the string. Now, we could readily understand gravitation if this illustration conveyed to us by the ball and the string were a correct representation of fact. But we very naturally ask, what is the connecting link? What is the string? Of what does it consist? And of what do all the connecting links between the sun and the myriad orbs of heaven consist? Would not the strings get somewhat entangled? Has this connecting link ever been observed anywhere? The answer to these pertinent questions is that there is no connecting link in existence. When the missing link is produced, we are prepared to admit all the gravitation theorists teach on the subject. Until then, we shall continue to regard it as the myth. It undoubtedly is. But we are not done with the illustration yet. The ball and string device sets forth that the body that attracts is not only connected with the body attracted, 
but that the former is the motive power of the latter, that the sun is the power which compels the earth to revolve round it, even as the motive power of the ball is the exertion of the hand of the operator. Without the connecting link the earth would fall, according to the astronomers, in a rectilinear path forever. But what these wise men do not see, and which is a necessary part of the theory, as represented by the ball and string idea, is that the motive power also must come from the sun. Without this motive power and the connecting link, the whole of the theory falls to pieces. There is no motive power in the sun to cause the earth to revolve around it, and there is no connecting link between the sun and the earth to keep the latter in its position. Consequently, the theory of universal gravitation has no existence in fact. He who cannot reason is a fool. He who will not reason is a bigot. He who dares not reason is a coward. But he who can and dares to reason is a man. If the reader can and dares to reason, let him reason this matter out and discover whether astronomy, as drummed into children's heads at school, and vauntingly displayed with many pictures from public platforms, has one inch of standing ground, or one reason to offer as an apology for its further existence, and power to befool mankind longer. The flood, as we have seen, was caused by the opening of the netting of heaven and the fountains of the abyss. The heaven or sky is an expanse for the clouds, strong as molten mirror, Job 37:18 and was made on the second day of creation, to separate the waters above from the waters below. Hast thou come to the springs of the sea? asks God. 38.16 It was formerly the opinion of Christian writers that these springs or fountains are in the central north, confined by the impenetrable walls of ice, which were broken down at the flood. However, when Noah had entered the ark, from heaven and the abyss rushed the waters to fulfill God's purpose to destroy the earth with its inhabitants. Hence the rending of rocks, the shattering of hills, the breaking up of earth's strata, the piling up mass upon mass, wherein were buried animals and plants to be dug up many centuries afterwards. All lands were filled with the wreck of the old world, a terrible warning to all future ages of the commission of unrighteousness. And let it be noted that the petrifaction of fossils is not surprising, seeing that the earth was wholly sunk under the water for a whole year. Even geologists confess that the degree of petrifaction is no proof of the antiquity of a fossil. The mere amount of change, then, which the fossil has undergone, is not by any means a proof of the length of time that has elapsed since it was buried in the earth, as that amount depends so largely on the nature of the material on which it was entombed and on the circumstances that have since surrounded it. Jukes, page 190. Quote, then, what was the origin of the rocks, indeed of the entire earth? Aqueous, according to Genesis 1, 1, 2, in the beginning of God's framing the heavens and the earth. The earth was in loose atoms and empty. Where were the loose atoms? In the abyss of waters. And God, on the third day of creation, consolidated all into rocks, stratified and unstratified, causing the land to appear. But why is man not found as a fossil embedded among the rocks, as are the animals? The answer is not difficult. Before the flood, man was not so prolific as now. During the 1,656 years of the old world, there were, according to Moses, only ten generations counting from Adam to Noah. Noah, during 600 years, had only three sons. However, let us reckon approximately the antediluvian population, allowing eight children to each couple. First generation, two. Second generation, eight. Third generation, thirty-two. Fourth generation, one twenty-eight. Fifth generation, five twelve. Sixth generation, two thousand forty-eight. Seventh generation, eight thousand one hundred ninety-two. Eighth generation, thirty-two thousand seven hundred sixty-eight. Ninth generation, 131,072. Tenth generation, 524,288. The sum is 699,050. 
and the whole human population before the flood might not amount to one-sixth of the population of London. Be it remembered that mankind in the old world dwelt in Asiatic Turkey, speaking the same language, and it was not till after Noah's death that the dispersion from Babel over the earth took place. Asiatic Turkey contains at present 15 million human beings, and there only could fossilized man be found. To what extent, if at all, has that country been geologically examined? Is it possible to deliver men from the spell and sorcery of great names? If only a fable or lie is called scientific, and fathered by a writer reputed a great man, how many thousands believed at once without proof? Is it not as hard to turn men from the worship of their fellow worms as to turn a Hindu from the worship of sticks and stones? The scientific favorites of newspaper scribblers are larded over with flattery until the reputation of greatness is attained, and to argue against pet scientific fictions is only to provoke silly jesting or astonishment at the presumption of daring to differ from the scientific slave drivers. Will any of their slaves of science dare to be free or use their common sense? Is geology not a tissue of suppositions from beginning to end? Let us see. The geologists managed to get dupes, some disguised infidel who has had sufficient influence to obtain a professorship. Some disguised infidel who has had sufficient influence to obtain a professorship in a college writes a book about the creation, in which he attempts to prove to the entire satisfaction of atheistic journalists that the world made itself without the help of God at all. Of course, the blasphemous character of the book is carefully veiled lest soft-headed religionists take alarm, and the book does not sell. Perhaps even a pious wine is dropped so that the work of Judas may be done more effectually, and the author is reputed so very great a man, for all the newspapers say it. By the way of preface, astronomy is appealed to as a science so well established that none but fools object to it. Therefore, the reader must imagine all the vast continents and oceans making up a ball, no larger than the schoolroom globe. Next, he is assured that recent researches in science have proved that those lights, the sun, moon, and stars, consist of the very same constituents as the earth and sea, as well as the nebulae, which science supposes to be clouds of glowing gas. So all these must have had a common origin, and therefore the simpleton must next imagine the schoolroom globe, along with the sun, moon, and stars, changed into a quantity of fiery gas. In the beginning, how many million years ago science cannot yet decide, was gas, is the dogma of geology. But he dare not ask about the origin of the gas itself. Then the mesmerist requires him to suppose that all the fiery mass very conveniently began to cool, particularly a quantity in the center, which also whirled about until it became the sun. The victim of duplicity is next set to suppose that other quantities also cooled until they changed into planets. Especially one quantity went on cooling until it very conveniently became the earth ball with a rocky crust and though on fire originally, yet a portion of it changed into all the oceans and seas. In the study of science does Dr. Dick in his book on geology, one is permitted to suppose anything if he will but remember and acknowledge to others that he only makes suppositions will give reasons to show that his suppositions may be true, and be ready at any time to give up his suppositions when facts go against them. The last of these two suppositions, namely the gradual cooling of the world from a state of intense heat, is often made by those who wish to form to themselves a notion of how the rocks and rivers, mountains and plains of the world have been brought to exist as they are. Page 10. Can the foolish geologists, instead of making these absurd suppositions, not believe the fact that God made the world as stated on God's own authority? Instead, however, of opening their eyes, they further suppose that despite the cooling, as much fire remained inside the ball as heaved up the rocky crust into mountain chains, whilst the waters went on channeling and leveling so as to make all the river and ocean beds. Then the rivers would carry down to lakes and seas matter containing animal and vegetable remains to form sediment which we must suppose hardened after millions of years into rocks, especially the stratified ones, the unstratified rock being supposed due to the original fire. 
All these atheistic suppositions are expressed in words of Greek origin, so as to amaze the gaping simpleton. The rocks immediately above the unstratified are called metamorphic. Next, in ascending order, are the Paleozoic, or primary, the Mesozoic, or secondary, the Cainozoic, including the Tertiary and Quaternary. The guesses about fossils make up paleontology. Now, let it be observed that not one of these suppositions is even probable. Whoever saw gas changed into granite, or a fiery vapor into water, or a river channel its own bed? Is there within the memory of mankind one considerable mountain more or less on the earth, notwithstanding volcanic eruptions and earthquakes? One considerable county more or less? Or what continent has materially changed its shape? What do fossils prove? The following is a confession from Scurchley's Geology, page 101. Quote, so imperfect is the record of the Earth's history as told in these rocks that we can never hope to fill up completely all the gaps in the chain of life. The testimony of the rocks has been well compared to a history of which only a few imperfect volumes remain to us, the missing portions of which we can only fill up by conjecture. What botanist but would despair of restoring the vegetation of wood and field from the dry leaves that autumn scatters? Yet from less than this the geologist has to form all his ideas of past floras. Can we wonder then at the imperfection of the geological world? Indeed, it is confessed that the age of a fossil is not determined by the degree of its petrification, but by the age of the rock in which it is embedded, and the age of the rock by its position among the strata. Have men in these last days become so silly that with old bones and stones and footmarks they may be led to deny the very God that made them? But was not this folly foretold ages ago by the inspired Hebrew prophets? Each layer of rocks is supposed by a geologist to have occupied an indefinite number of millions of years, and the age of the earth is still more a mystery to them. Professor Thompson, who is a scientific dictator, has, however, announced that the solidification of the earth could not have taken less than 20 million years, and not more than 400 million years, and so that the date of the world's beginning is somewhere between these two numbers. Some time ago, geologists proved from scientific data to their own entire satisfaction, and that of their dupes, that the earth is a ball of liquid fire with a thin crust of rock, so that at a depth of 25 miles the rocks must melt, and at 150 they would go off in vapor. Dr. Dick's Natural History, page 12. But Professor Thompson has found out that those suppositions do not square with the supposition of gravitation, and accordingly he supposes, rather, that the mass of the earth cannot be much less rigid than a globe of steel of the same size would be. Yet there, there must be some quantity of the fiery liquid left in the interior, enough at least to cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. What tinkering the imaginary globe of the astronomer needs? Some geologists, such as Jukes, are not certain whether the earth was a molten mass at first, and whether granite is of igneous or aqueous origin. Formerly rocks were classified as primary, transition, secondary, tertiary, recent, but now, by a new arrangement, the transitionary rocks are denied any place in the series. Jukes says that he holds views with regard to the Devonian period, which differ from those taken by most geologists, and that the question is hardly yet settled, page 203. Also, regarding the stratified rocks, he observes that at one time it was thought that there was some essential distinction in the nature of these rocks and their mode of formation. It is now known or thought that the primary rocks when first formed were exactly like the corresponding secondary and tertiary. That at one time it was thought that there was some essential distinction, that there was some essential distinction in the nature of these rocks and their mode of formation. It is now known that the primary rocks when first formed were exactly like the corresponding secondary and tertiary, page 202. Indeed, is there anything certain about geology except that it is disguised atheism, denying God the Creator? Geologists profess to prove extinct species. Of course, they can produce large bones to show that at one time there were large elephants and lizards, but are big dogs not dogs as really as little ones? Is it a fact, according to Moses, there were human giants before the flood, and that since the lower animals have degenerated in size and age as well as men, need not surprise this 19th century of crime and infidelity?
but the trick of comparative anatomy is to claim with an old bone the power of reproducing the sketch of the entire animal, though formerly unknown. If the monkey had been unknown to Darwin and the scientists, would they have been able by seeing one hand only to tell that that beast has four hands? If zoologists think the serpents once had wings or feet, let them read Genesis 3.14, On thy belly shalt thou go. Let scientists err concluding that any kind of animal has become extinct, consider the words of Jukes himself, quote, as all the truth about anything whatever is absolutely unattainable by us, it would only lead us astray if we required it from geology, or reasoned as if we had attained it, page 202. But recently, the existence of the gorilla became known. What of the leviathan, the swift serpent, the crooked serpent, the dragon that is in the sea? Isaiah 27. Is it not chiefly the fossilized bones of the sea serpent that geologists are exhibiting as the remains of extinct species of a vast size? No wonder the present existence of the leviathan is so eagerly denied. S. Lang in his Modern Science and Modern Thought, page 27, informs us that, quote, The total thickness of known strata is about 130,000 feet, or 25 miles. Of this, about 30,000 feet belong to the Laurentian, which is the oldest known stratified deposit, 18,000 to the Cambrian, and 22,000 to the Silurian. These form together what is known as the primary, or Paleozoic, epoch. Mr. Lang is very careful to omit the names of those who know strata for a depth of 25 miles. Can it be that he has been down there himself? If so, we may expect to have further revelations as to the contents of the bowels of the earth. But no, he cannot have been there, for he tells us a little further on, page 37, quote, at this rate of increase, water would boil at a depth of 10,000 feet, and iron and all other metals would be melted before we reached 100,000 feet. We are thus satisfied that the gifted author was not actually there, or he would have been melted in company with iron and all other metals. This is a relief, and enables us to at once and forever dispose of his wild theories as baseless assumptions. In a certain case before the magistrate, the culprit hardly liked to say that the witness against him was telling a lie, so he mildly said that the witness was handling the truth very carelessly. When Mr. Lang has the impertinence to tell us what lies below the surface of the earth for a depth of 25 miles, we are bound to say that he handles the truth in a careless and most reprehensible manner. With the usual unqualified manner for which scientists have become famous, Mr. Lang goes on to say, quote, Reasoning from these facts, assuming the rate of change in the forms of life to have been the same formerly, Lyle has arrived at the conclusion that geology requires a period of not less than 200 million of years to account for the phenomena which it discloses. To reason from facts, and then to assume something which in its very essence is utterly incapable of proof, is bad enough. But to miscall fiction's facts, and then to add on to them whatever assumption is necessary to maintain the result in keeping with the theory with which the start was made, is so atrocious that we are again forced to the conclusion that geologists are lost in the fogs of their own creation, and cannot find their way through the millions of ages of their own imagination, to anything having the remotest bit of truth in it. Once more, and I have done with Mr. Lang and his geology, he informs us in the work already referred to that, quote, The law of gravity, which is the foundation of most of what we call the natural laws of geological action, has certainly prevailed, as will be shown later, through the enormous periods of geological time, and far beyond this we can discern it operating in those astronomical changes by which cosmic matter has been condensed into nebulae, nebulae into suns, throwing off planets, and planets throwing off satellites, as they cooled and contracted. The laws of geological action, being based on a myth, the laws of gravitation, geology itself may be thrown off into space without any ill effects being felt anywhere. Geology and astronomy, as at present taught by the schoolmen, are nothing more than fables.
hear what the future of February 1892 says. Quote, Astronomers are very fond of boasting of the wonderful exactness of their science, and that it is based on the principles of incontrovertible mathematics and of ridiculing astrology as a pseudoscience. The exactness belongs to practical and not to theoretical astronomy. For example, when the writer learnt the principles of astronomy at school, he was taught that the sun was exactly 95 millions of miles from the Earth. Nowadays, astronomers say that this was an error and that the sun is only 92 millions of miles distant. Newton made the sun's distance to be 28 millions of miles. Kepler made it 12 millions. Martin, 81 million, and Meyer, 104 millions. Dr. Woodhouse, who was professor of astronomy at Cambridge about 50 years ago, was so candid as to admit the weakness of the Newtonian speculations. Woodhouse wrote, However perfect our theory, and however simply and satisfactorily the Newtonian hypothesis may seem to us to account for all the celestial phenomena, yet we are here compelled to admit the astounding truth that if our premises be disputed and our facts challenged, the whole range of astronomy does not contain the proofs of its own accuracy. The Horizon According to tables of curvature compiled to suit the mathematical factors and tentative formulas employed in the imaginary geodetic operations, which have from time to time been conducted in observatories, the horizon of an observer is distant or near according to the greatness or otherwise of his elevation above the surface of the supposed globe. If he stands 24 feet above sea level, he is said to be in the center of a circle which bounds his vision the radius of which in any direction on a clear day is six miles. A local gentleman tells me that he has watched a boat race in New Zealand, seeing the boats all the way out and home, the distance being nine miles from where he was standing on the beach. I have seen the hull of a steamer, with the naked eye, at an elevation of not more than 24 feet, at a distance of 12 miles, and in taking observations along the South African coast, have sometimes had an horizon of at least 20 miles, at an elevation of 20 feet only. The distance of the horizon or vanishing point, where the sky appears to touch the earth and sea, is determined largely by the weather, and when that is clear by the power of our vision. This is proved by the fact that the telescope will increase the distance of the horizon very greatly, and bring objects into view which are entirely beyond the range of vision of the unaided eye. But as no telescope can pierce a segment of water, the legitimate conclusion we are forced to arrive at is that the surface of water is level, and that, therefore, the shape of the world cannot be globular, and on such a flat or level surface, the greater the elevation of the observer, the longer will his range of vision be, and thus the farther he can see. On the term level, advocates of the globular form of the world often fall back on the meaning of the term level, affirming that a level surface means an even surface and not a horizontal or flat one. That is to say that a convex surface, if free from irregularities, is even or level. In Nuttall's Standard Dictionary, 1892, edition page 409, the following is the definition of level. Quote, horizontal, even, flat, on the same line of plane. This shows that level is the same as horizontal or flat, and could not possibly apply to a convex surface. In the Cruise of the Falcon by E.F. Knight, the following occurs on page 2 of volume 2. Quote, there are no curves on the way, the rails being carried in one perfectly straight line across the level planes. Level here means flat or horizontal, as the planes in South America are known to be for thousands of square miles. Robinson's New Navigation and Surveying, page 25, says, quote, The spirit level, which is usually on the underside of the surveyor's transit instrument, is used to determine a horizontal line. A horizontal line is at right angles to a vertical. It is a level line. The following is from the same work, page 33. Quote, to adjust a theodolite, measure very carefully the distance between two stations and set the instrument halfway between them. Now bring the level near to one of the stations, level it carefully and sight the rod. Note the number on the rod, say six feet, and have the rod man go to the other station and place his target on the rod just six feet. When the telescope is turned upon it, the horizontal spider line ought to just coincide with the target 
and will if the instrument is level or in perfect adjustment. From the foregoing, it is very clear that the level means horizontal and cannot mean convex. G.F. Chambers, in his Story of the Solar System, pages 84 and 85, quotes Sir H. Holland as seeing the eclipsed moon with the sun above the horizon. I quote the following from Mr. Chambers, quote, This spectacle requires, however, a combination of circumstances rarely occurring, a perfectly clear eastern and western horizon, and an entirely level intervening surface, such as that of the sea or the African desert, unquote. In a lunar eclipse such as described, the sun is distant from the moon half a circle, or 180 degrees, both luminaries being 90 degrees from the observer, so that on a convex surface it would be impossible to see both bodies at the same time, but quite possible from a level or horizontal surface, which actually was the case. To see about 6,000 miles to the sun on the one side and about 6,000 miles to the moon on the other side, one would require to be projected 4,000 miles into space, above the horizon of the globe, in order to overcome the convexity in the distance. Thus, level, we are again assured, means horizontal or flat, or on the same line of plane, as the dictionary informs us. In The Voyage of a Naturalist by Charles Darwin, page 328, the following is stated, quote, I was reminded of the pampas of Buenos Aires by seeing the disk of the rising sun intersected by an horizon level as that of the ocean, unquote. The surface here referred to was a flat one, and such are called llanos or level fields in South America. Level, therefore, signifies flat or horizontal. Lighthouses The distance at which lights can be seen at sea entirely disposes of the idea that we are living on a huge ball. From a tract, The Bible vs. Science, by J.C. Acaster, Hull, I extract the following, quote, a lighthouse on the Isle of Wight, 180 feet high, St. Catharines, has recently been fitted with an electric light of such penetrating power, 7 million candles, that it can be seen 42 miles. At that distance, according to modern science, the vessel would be 996 feet below the horizon. Extract from a letter written by a passenger on board the Iberia, Orient Line RMS, quote, At noon on Thursday... 27th of September, we were 169 miles from Port Said. By the ship's log, our rate of steaming was 324 miles in 24 hours. At 12 p.m., we were alongside the lighthouse at Port Said, it having become visible at 7.30, when it was about 58 miles away. It is an ordinary tower, about as high as the tower at Springhead, 60 feet, lit by electricity. Unquote. According to modern science, the vessel would be 2,182 feet below the horizon. Extract from Manx Sun, July 24, 1894. Quote, the weather of late has been very fine. It was a splendid sight on Sunday evening to see the land and air in Cumberland, so clear that houses could be seen with the naked eye, and the smoke from Whitehaven and other towns could be seen very distinctly. Ramsey Bay appeared as if it was enclosed by the surrounding land, from Black Coombe to the point of air, Wellney Light being seen distinctly, distance 45 miles. End quote. In February 1894, a discussion on the subject of the shape of the world was carried on in the columns of the Cape Argus Cape Town by the writer on the one side and three antagonists on the other. From the evidence of the edition, the paper in a footnote to the first letter of Ancient Mariner, that Dassin Island light that had been seen from the beach road at Sea Point, it was shown that water is level. This light is 155 feet above sea level, at its focal plane, and according to the published report of the Inspector of Public Works for 1893, had been seen from the bridge of a mail steamer more than 40 miles away. This ancient mariner did not believe, and asked, if anything had gone wrong with the shape of the earth hereabouts. One of his supporters, in a letter to the paper, after the editor, had stated that the light had been seen from the beach road at Sea Point, 33 miles away, stated that by climbing a hill so many feet the light might be seen. Thus will ignorant prejudice flaunt itself in the face of truth. 
If the Earth were a globe, it is evident that Dassin Island Light could not be seen from a steamer's bridge 40 miles away, nor from an elevation of 20 feet at a distance of 33 miles. In the former case, allowing 40 feet for altitude of observer, the light would be 871 feet below the horizon, and in the latter 551 feet below. At the close of the controversy, I challenged Ancient Mariner to test the case by an appeal to an experiment on the waters of Table Bay, and am still waiting an acceptance of that challenge. I am now credibly informed that the bluff light, natal or natal, has been seen at sea from a distance of 30 miles. This light is 282 feet above sea level, and should, according to the globe theory, have been 298 feet below the horizon, allowing 20 feet for the height of the observer. Another, and an unconscious witness to the fact of the horizontality of water, is Mr. Smith of Cape Point, as the following shows. A light from afar, to the editor of the Cape Times. Quote, Sir, at nine o'clock this evening, the danger point light was distinctly visible to the naked eye from the homestead at Cape Point, about 150 feet above sea level, this being the first occasion since the erection of the danger point lighthouse on which the flashes of light have been noticed by myself. The light must be most powerful to be seen from a distance of over 50 miles on a clear night. I timed half a minute interval between each three quick flashes. K. Point, August 22, 1894. I am an etc. A. E. Smith. In a letter from the engineer of public works dated Cape Town, 2nd February, 1898, I am informed that, quote, the focal plane of Point Danger Lighthouse is elevated 150 feet above high water level. According to this, therefore, if the world be a globe, the light should have been 1,666 feet below Mr. Smith's line of sight. In answers of 2nd May, 1896, the following appears, quote, The steeple or stump, as it is locally called, of the parish church of St. Botolph at Boston, on the southeast coast of Lincolnshire, near the Wash, has long been utilized as a lighthouse. The tower is 290 feet in height and resembles that of Antwerp Cathedral, being crowned by a beautiful octagonal lantern. This tower, being invisible 40 miles distance, serves as a lighthouse to guide mariners when entering what are called the Boston and Lynn Deeps. According to globular principles, this light should be hidden below the horizon for nearly 800 feet. From Music and Morals by H. R. Havice, I extracted the following. Quote, the Antwerp spire is 403 feet high from the foot of the tower. Strasbourg measures 468 feet from the level of the sea, but less than 403 feet from the level of the plain. By the clear morning light from the steeple at Notre Dame at Antwerp, the panorama can hardly be surpassed. 126 steeples may be counted far and near. Facing northward, the Scheldt winds away until it loses itself in a white line, which is none other than the North Sea. By the aid of a telescope, ships can be distinguished out on the horizon, and the captains declare they can see the lofty spire at 150 miles distance, Middleburg at 75 miles, Fleezing 65 miles, are also visible from the steeple, looking towards Holland we can distinguish Breda and Walladu, each about 54 miles off. The above spire would be out of sight a mile below the horizon at a distance of 150 miles, and as no telescope can piece a segment of water, the conclusion is that water is level. The Earth Review of July 1894 says, The captain of the SS Milo, referring to the question as to how far a powerful light can be seen, says, The other day, when off Skagen, the rays from Hansholman Lighthouse were distinctly visible, though the light was fully 72 miles away. Mr. B. wrote and asked how the light could be seen unless the lighthouse was 3,500 feet above sea level. This is the official reply he received. Quote, Editorial Department, Titbits, December 21, 1892. The paragraph you refer to was sent to me by the captain of the SS Milo, and he vouched for its accuracy. Under these circumstances, I cannot enter into a discussion as to the possibility of his being able to see it or not. 
P.S. Mr. B. allowed that the reported observation was made from a masthead 100 feet above sea level. In the Argus Annual for 1894, it is stated on pages 207 and 271, the natal or natal bluff light, 292 feet above water level, has been seen at a distance of 30 miles. According to globe measurements, it should have been about 300 feet below the line of sight. The natal mercury of 18th July 1898 states, the Cape Lagulas lighthouse is to be reconstructed to allow the introduction of a flash light. A lighthouse erected two miles from Fish River has been completed. The tower is 33 feet high and 238 feet above sea level, and the flashlight is visible for over 50 miles. This light would be 1,400 feet below an observer's line of sight, at an elevation of 28 feet, if the world was a globe. The following is extracted from Scraps of 27 August 1898. Quote, I have recently received the following letter, which I confess fogs me just about as much as the writer of it complains of being fogged. Sir, in your issue, number 772, you give an account of the lighthouse at New York, Liberty Enlightening the World. You say the light can be seen 60 miles away at sea, and I think you must be mistaken. A textbook I have by me on surveying and leveling gives 8 inches per mile, actually 7.962 inches, as the correction to be made for curvature of the Earth's surface in setting out canals, railways, etc., varying inversely with the square of the distance. Thus, 60 by 60 by 8 divided by 12 equals 2,400 feet. And making allowance for the light being 326 feet above sea level, it should be 2,074 feet below the horizon at 60 miles. Now, one, either your figures are wrong, or two, the weight of the statue has flattened the earth for 60 miles roundabout, or three, surveyors do not allow eight inches for curvature and let their canals and railways stick out over the side of the earth like gigantic fishing rods. I confess I am in a fog. Can you enlighten me in your facts and fancies column? Yours truly, Foggy. End quote. I won't attempt to analyze Foggy's fogging calculations, but he is certainly very wrong. Any navigator will tell you that the horizon is visible at about 15 miles from the hurricane deck of a steamer, at 20 from the bridge deck and at a proportionally greater distance from the masthead. But beyond this, you have to remember the added penetration given to lighthouse lights by means of refraction and reflection. End quote. A light can only be seen on the surface of a globe, at a distance the square of which multiplied by 8 inches nearly is equal to its height. This applies no matter how powerful the light may be, because no light can pierce the water, nor can the natural eye, with or without a telescope glass, do so. But, says someone, there is no allowance made for refraction in any of the foregoing calculations. That is quite true, but constitutes no valid objection in the light of the following extract from the Encyclopedia Britannica article, Leveling. Quote, we suppose the visual rays to be a straight line, whereas on account of the unequal densities of the air at a different distances from the Earth, the rays of light are incurvated by refraction. The effect of this is to lessen the difference between the true and apparent levels, but in such an extremely variable and uncertain manner that if any constant or fixed allowance is made for it in formula or tables, it will often lead to a greater error than what it was intended to obviate. For, though the refraction may at a mean compensate for about one-seventh of the curvature of the Earth, it sometimes exceeds one-fifth and at other times does not amount to one fifteenth. We have, therefore, made no allowance for refraction in the foregoing formulae. We are fairly entitled to conclude, therefore, from the reliable data furnished as to how far lights at sea can be seen, that the world is again an extended plane, and not the globe of astronomical speculation. The Midnight Sun
M. Paul B. Dushayu published a few years ago a work entitled The Land of the Midnight Sun, of which the following are extracts. The sun at midnight is always north of the observer, on account of the position of the earth. It seems to travel around in a circle, requiring 24 hours for its completion, it being noon when it reaches the greatest elevation, and midnight at the lowest. Its ascent and descent are so imperceptible at the pole, and the variation so slight, that it sinks south very slowly, and its disappearance below the horizon is almost immediately followed by its reappearance. We have here spoken as if the observer were on a level with the horizon, but should he climb a mountain, the sun of course will appear higher, and should he, instead of traveling 15 miles north, climb about 220 feet above the sea level each day, he would see it in the same as if he had gone north. Consequently, if he stood at the Arctic Circle at that elevation, and had an unobstructed view of the horizon, he would see the sun one day sooner. Hence tourists from Haparanda prefer going to Avasaxa, a hill 680 feet above the sea, from which, from which though 8 or 10 miles south of the Arctic Circle, they can see the midnight sun for three days. As the voyage drew to a close and we approached the upper end of the Gulf of Bothnia, the twilight had disappeared and between the settling and rising of the sun hardly one hour elapsed. Haparanda is 65 degrees 51 minutes north latitude and 41 miles south of the Arctic Circle. It is 1 degree and 18 minutes farther north than Arkhangelsk, or Archangel, and in the same latitude as the most northern part of Iceland. The sun rises on the 21st of June at 12.01 a.m and sets at 11.37 p.m. From the 22nd to the 25th of June, the traveler may enjoy the sight of the midnight sun from Avasaxa, a hill 680 feet high and about 45 miles distant, on the other side of the stream, and should he be a few days later by driving north on the high road, he may still have the opportunity of seeing it. If the earth be a globe, at midnight the eye would have to penetrate thousands of miles of land and water even at 65 degrees north latitude, in order to see the sun at midnight. That the sun can be seen for days together in the far north during the northern summer proves that there is something very seriously wrong with the globular hypothesis. Besides this, how is it that the midnight sun is never seen in the south during the southern summer? Cook penetrated as far as south 71 degrees. Weddell in 1893 reached as far as 74 degrees and Sir James C. Ross in 1841 and 1842 reached the 78th parallel. But, but I am not aware that any of these navigators have left it on record that the sun was seen at midnight in the south. Captain Woodside of the American Barkentine Echo at Cape Town on 26 June 1898 reports that he had been a good deal in the reports that he had been a good deal in the Great Southern Ocean and often went in latitude 62 degrees south. He has had a kind of daylight all night, but not sufficient to read by. But the midnight sun was never seen. Since writing the foregoing, I have received from the Secretary of the Royal Belgian Geographical Society a paper entitled Expedition Antarctique Belge. In this paper, it is stated by Lieutenant de Gerlache, the commander of the expedition, that on 17th May the sun set and was not seen above our horizon again until 21st July. This was during the severest part of the winter at latitude 71 degrees, 36 minutes south. On pages 9 and 10 of the same pamphlet, it is stated that the ship quitted her winter quarters on the 14th February. She had thus been a winter and a summer in the ice at that latitude. During the winter, the extraordinary phenomena of total darkness caused by the total disappearance of the sun for two months is duly recorded, and had the sun been seen at midnight in the summer, it is only natural and reasonable that such another extraordinary phenomenon should have been chronicled, but there is not one word in the pamphlet about the matter. We conclude, therefore, that there is no midnight sun in the south. The midnight sun can be seen in the north during the summer at 66 degrees of latitude, and if there be the same extraordinary phenomenon in the south, it must have been seen at the latitude the Belgica reached much sooner and longer, 
than it is in the north at latitude 66. Motions of the Earth In The Story of the Heavens by Sir R. Ball, the following accounts of the motions of the Earth globe are given. Page 3. It became certain that whatever were the shape of the Earth, it was at all events something detached from all other bodies and poised without visible support in space.